Hello everyone and and welcome to this uh, this new day uh, of our of our conference and we are very much uh, honored today to start this sessions for today with a workshop on how to write the pub for the public by someone who has been concentrating in this objective over the past uh, several years. So our uh, workshop speaker today is an anthropologist and editor-in-chief of Sapiens, the online anthropology magazine that was launched in January 2016 with the mission of bringing anthropology to the public prior to being full-time editor-in-chief since last year. He was the senior curator of anthropology at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science from 2007 to 2020. He received his PhD from Indiana University and has received grants and fellowships from various uh, international and American institutions. His research has been highlighted by various media outlets internationally, and his writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, and many other prestigious publications. Given that our conference theme is decolonizing anthropology, it's especially interesting to note that of the remarkable 12 books that SHIP has published, many of them touch on themes that are familiar to many of us in the Philippines, which include looking at indigenous peoples and how they are represented, including in museums. His One of his recent books, I believe, is award-winning book, entitled Plundered Skulls and Stolen Spirits Inside the Fight to Reclaim Native America's Culture, asks hard questions about who owns the past and the objects that connect us to, to history. And he uses his experience as a curator, as a museum curator, to reflect on, on indigenous heritage and representation. So on a personal note, uh, Chip, I worked with Chip as a columnist of Sapiens, and it's, it's an honor to be part of this project. And I'm really looking forward to this workshop, which I'm sure will be uh, a learning experience for all of us. So it's my honor to call now uh, Dr. Chip Caldwell, 
of Sapiens. Thank you so much, uh, Gideon, for the kind introduction and uh, for the chance to be able to meet with all of you. Uh, really, it's just such an honor uh, to have the chance to connect with the organization and have the chance, hopefully, to start to build some relationships with anthropologists in the Philippines and beyond. And so I really see this, hopefully, as an invitation um, to work together and hopefully just the first step on a long journey um, that we can take together to uh, try to reach new kinds of publics. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, really. It's, it's, it's me who feels honored to be a part of, of your conference. Um, I'm going to do a screen share here to get us started. All right, and I hope we're seeing that okay. Is that coming through, Gideon? Yep, okay, great, great. Uh, and I'd very much invite you, Gideon, to please jump in. You know, I'm, I'm presenting today very much from my experience here in the United States and uh, publishing and writing in, in North America and Europe. Um, and there's, of course, uh, great differences all around the world. And, and there is no one public. There's many kinds of publics. And Gideon has just done a phenomenal job of showing how anthropologists can connect with many of those publics through his writing and, and other work. So, so I definitely invite you, Gideon, to, to contribute as well as anyone else um, that is a part of this conversation. I would very much like to learn uh, as much as to share uh, a few things that I've learned. Um, so I have two hours with you, and I'm, I'm hoping to uh, have this in kind of two parts. The first part is a presentation about some general principles in writing for the public, and then the second part is how to pitch magazine or newspapers, how to approach them. Um, I know everyone is incredibly busy. Um, you probably have a phone next to you or maybe your email is up, um, but I very much invite you to um, try to center yourself within this presentation for the next few hours um, to be helpful uh, to your colleagues. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that we can have some volunteers. Is that possible? Maybe if um, if uh, I'm not sure if they can come into this space, the digital space or not, but if, if we can, um, I'd very much um, love feedback and some conversation too. And then I just want to emphasize that everyone here uh, belongs here. You know, this is a space for anthropologists um, to engage in conversation, to learn uh, from each other and with each other um, about our field, about our discipline. Um, and so I just hope everyone feels welcomed. Uh, very much to be a part of this conversation. So uh, Gideon gave a very lovely introduction and background um, to my work, and I would um, I would just add on to that a bit around the theme of decolonization as this conference to note that, as Gideon mentioned, you know, I've done in my own research, I wear kind of different hats, and one of the hats is when I'm wearing re doing research is I work with Native American communities and I try to develop collaborative community-based methods that often are a um, decolonizing kind of effort um, to bridge the worlds of anthropology and those communities that have often been uh, seen as mere subjects and objects of anthropology rather than participants and inclusive members of it. And I saw this particularly when I started working with tribes in the US Southwest and I saw how much research had been done on them and yet how little of the writing and research that had been done had actually gone back to those communities. So I saw this disconnect between anthropological and scientific and academic conversations and the writing we do, and this kind of wall um, that often didn't lead back to the communities that were often the focus of that work, as well as other communities that were invested in the questions of our work. So starting about 20 years ago, I really wanted to try to break down that wall to find help our discipline as much as in my own work to find ways to communicate with different kinds of publics. And that's really what Sapiens um, has been and um, I hope continues to be in the years to come. I wanted to start too with a story that might be um, familiar to some of you. Uh, it begins with uh, Jane Goodall as a young uh, woman in 1960, before she was a world famous anthropologist. At the time, she was 
curious young woman from England trying to get her, her uh, trying to learn about the world and find her way in the world. And she met Louis Leakey and Louis Leakey helped her set up a project in what's now Tanzania to study the lives of chimpanzees. And at the time, chimpanzees were their, their lives as emotional animals, as emotional creatures were hardly known. Their behaviors were unknown. Their, their, their interactions with each other were almost entirely unknown. And so Goodall landed in the summer of 1960 in Tanzania and began to do this work. And after a number of months, she had barely got close enough to study them. Uh, it was very difficult. There was a lot of violence in the region. Uh, she was running out of money and she really hadn't made any major discoveries at all. And one day in November of 1960, uh, she turned a corner in the forest and she saw a chimp that she later named David Greer, uh, Greybeard pulling out a straw uh, and uh, fashioning it into a tool and digging out termites. And so I'm sure, you know, famous anthropological story, I'm sure a lot of us know it. Um, but what we may not know is how good all thought about that moment and how she would communicate it. And I went to a lecture a few years ago where she talked about, you know, she first published an academic paper in science, a major, uh, you know, one of the world's leading uh, academic journals. Um, and it got a lot of coverage and, you know, within the discipline, uh, it definitely helped establish her credentials. But it wasn't until a 1965 documentary by National Geographic that it depicted this research for a broad general public. It wasn't until that moment that she was launched into worldwide fame. Um, and so it really was the translation of her research for a public that became central to uh, her research and to making her uh, work uh, become what we all know as it today. And she said in this lecture, right from the beginning, it was very obvious to me how important it was to involve the media, to share scientific observations with the general public. Why should we keep knowledge in an ivory tower when it can make so much difference? And I went to see this lecture right at the moment, actually, I was helping to develop Sapiens. And it just struck such a chord with me because I think we kind of all need that North Star. You know, we need to be thinking about what is it, why is it we're doing our work? What is it we're hoping to change in the world and how is it we can do it? So I would invite all of you to ask yourself these questions. You know, what knowledge do you want to have outside the ivory tower and what difference do you want to make? And I think if you can answer those two questions yourself with clarity, it will give you a lot of direction and inspiration in doing this work. And this is, there's arguably never been a better time in the history of anthropology to be a public scholar. Um, there's more opportunities than ever to share our public, share our research with the public. And this includes not only, you know, avenues like YouTube, um, you know, doing TED Talks and those sorts of things, uh, but especially in public writing. Some people even call this the golden age of scientific journalism and scientific writing, because there are just so many different ways, so many different venues in which we can present our work um, to all different kinds of publics. And of course, one of those is Sapiens, the online magazine of the Wenner Gren Foundation. As Sapiens, uh, as Gideon mentioned, we've been around uh, for about five years now. Uh, we're now up to about four to five million readers uh, a year. And we're uh, less than 50% of our readers come from the United States. So many of our readers are from all over the world. And I would mention that um, the uh, third most common reading public for Sapiens is the Philippines. Um, and I think this is largely has to do with Gideon's popularity. Um, and so I credit him uh, uh, with that. But nonetheless, I would, I would note that for all of you um, who might be interested in writing for us that, you know, we are a venue for, you know, reaching publics all over the world. But certainly the, Philippine, um, the Philippines is one geograph geographical point in the globe where we have many readers. We publish about 150 articles a year, about three, basically three articles a week. And so we work with about 150 authors um, a year. And we're actively uh, hoping to broaden the scope of the kinds of anthropology that um, are um, presented. Uh, we really are aspiring for a kind of global anthropology um, in the digital pages of Sapiens. So 
Today's workshop, as I mentioned, we're going to first go over some general principles of writing for the public. Then we're going to talk about um, the pitch. And then I'm going to mention at the end um, a uh, plans for a next class or next workshop, if, um, if that's of interest um, to, to any of you. So I'm going to go through here a string of what I see as kind of first principles of writing for the public. And the first one and most central one in my mind is audience, audience, and audience. It's vital that we think of our reader when writing for the public. You know, when writing academically, and I'm an academic writer too, and there's great value in academic writing, but you don't often have to put yourself in the place of the reader. You can trust that if you're publishing, you know, in an academic venue, that your colleagues are going to be reading it because it's necessary for their work. Um, you know, it's necessary for them to understand your ideas, your arguments, your evidence. Um, with the public, there's no guarantee. There's so much out in the world. People are so busy. Um, they can stop reading whatever, 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 whatever it is you've written uh, anytime. So we have to put our reader first. So we have to think about who they are. You know, we have to think about their age, you know, their gender, what country they're from. Are we trying to reach policymakers or lawmakers? Are we trying to reach other editors or maybe book agents? Are we trying to reach professors and students? Maybe we're trying to reach the community that we work in. So all of these different audiences will have very different motivations, very different expectations. And so we need to write to them. It doesn't mean you exclude or you know, you're unconcerned about you know, multiple publics, but it's ideal to have a kind of audience member in your head an ideal audience member in your head that you're writing to. So you're trying to picture who this person is, and then you're also asking yourself, why is it that they would read the piece that you've written? And for most non-academic writing, um, the answer is not because they have to. You know, a lot of people are reading because they want to be entertained. Maybe they're at a bus stop or they're lying in bed at night and they're, you know, wanting to kind of relax and think about the world. So they're looking to be entertained. Other people, you know, are very active on social media and they kind of want to be in the know. Um, so they want to be know about the latest news, the kind of coolest insights, and they want to be able to um, share that uh, often on social media. Um, some people want to learn about the world. About 30% of our readers um, at Sapiens come from Google searches. So people will put in, you know, um, uh, a, sub, uh, a topic in Google, and that's how they'll come to us. So almost a third of our readers. Other people want to learn about the world, expand their horizons. Um, people are uh, using us as a resource for classes, right? So, and there's many other reasons that you can imagine. So ideally, you're trying to form this picture in your mind of who this person is, so that you are targeting them with their needs, with their vision of the world, and it doesn't mean you're pandering to them, but it does mean that you're trying to understand who they are and what motivates them. And this is just a fundamental principle in that your reader is always going to come first. And, you know, in anthropology writing and anthropological writing, we can often put in, you know, things because we as theorists, we as practitioners in the field, we feel that it's vital that it goes in there. Whereas in popular writing, um, you, you strip away everything except for what's going to keep your reader engaged. Okay, the second um, uh, central principle here is to avoid anthrospeak or jargon. And so this is a um, little interactive, um, little interactive game that was created by my colleague, Jeff Martin at the American Anthropological Association. And I think it demonstrates the way in which we often within the field are coming up with language that um, serves a purpose. You know, jargon is a kind of shortcut uh, for us so we can speak to each other efficiently without having to explain big concepts. But at the same time, we often kind of get locked in this mode of trying to come up with new terms to maybe sound like we're, we're we're presenting new ideas. And we can kind of get trapped in the beauty of the language itself and the abstract beauty of the language itself. So the game here is um, to pick 
one word from set one, one word from set two, and one word from set three. And um, maybe Gideon, uh, if I could ask you, if you're if you're uh, willing, could I ask you to pick three three terms, one from each set? Sure. Uh, I pick periodic neoliberal projection. Perfect. We have just coined you and I a new term: periodic neoliberal projection. And so, you know, that sounds cool, right? Like, and that probably does mean something, and it could mean something, right? But we often kind of get trapped in this idea that we're coming up with new terms um, and you have to come up with new language in order to come up with new ideas. And with popular writing, especially, they're not looking for a sophistication of language. They're not looking for you knitting together these, these different and disparate concepts. They're looking for a clear takeaway that they can present to their friends, to their family, um, over dinner tables, you know, over drinks, right? They're looking for content in their life that help them feel illuminated. Another key concept here is to simplify complexity. And so anthropologists in particular are really good at embracing complexity. You know, I think it's one of the core values of the discipline is to understand the nuances of any question, um, to understand the exceptions in any study. And so we're really good at that. And yet for writing for the public, we have to find ways to take that complexity and to narrow it down because we just don't have the space or the time to, um, to allow for complications. So this is another uh, interaction here. And um, this is a paragraph that comes from an abstract to an anthropology conference. And it is very, um, I think, a good example. And I'm not picking on this person. I think our whole discipline is often guilty of this, is that we, we kind of use very complex language to actually talk about what can be straightforward yet very important ideas. Um, so I don't know, is it possible for someone to like raise their hand and we can bring them in um, and they could could participate here? Is that te technologically possible? Okay, well, actually, I'm sorry, I just expanded my screen. So it looks like there are other people that have access here. So let's try this. So what, what the activity is, um, is I'm looking to see if someone would be willing to uh, help the whole group try to understand what this anthropologist was saying in plain English. Like, so you're trying to translate this language, uh, complicated anthropological language, to someone who knows no anthropology at all. Like, what is this person really saying? And I should mention that, you know, I have a PhD in anthropology. I've studied anthropology for 20 years, and I struggle <laughs> with understanding even what this person is trying to say. So. Um, I'm just looking for someone to give a shot at, at helping us to think through um, what is this person really trying to get at? What, and because it's a really important point that they're trying to make. Are there any uh, takers, uh, anyone willing to give that a shot? All right, well, no worries. Um, allow me to make an attempt. And, you know, I had the luxury of being able to um, being able to sit down and try to make sense of it. But I think this is what the person is trying to say. They're trying to say something like, for a long time, scholars thought that the modern age would turn people away from religion towards more secular beliefs. But religious life continues to be an essential part of our world. So how should we think about religious practices and questions such as what is sacred today? Right, so like a really, really great, important question. And at the same time, what this person was doing with their language was I think trying to complicate it and make it sound, not only was this a great question, but to make it sound like a very sophisticated question. 
Whereas I think what our obligation is as scholars, as much as public communicators, is to narrow down the language so that it is clear and straightforward and that the idea itself comes through. It's the idea that matters here, not the language around it. So, you know, it's like separating the grain from the shaft, right? Where we're, the grain is what it is we want to pass along. And we use language often as kind of an encasing around the idea. But we want to be able to pass along that idea uh, without um, the, the unnecessary kind of verbiage around it. So some people might say, you know, does this mean dumbing down the science or the research? And the answer is definitely not. It just means that you are walking the reader slowly through the logic of your arguments, step by step in plain language, taking care not to lose them. And when I'm writing for the public, I often use this uh, kind of metaphor in my mind of you're like these two people walking along on a path and you have this person behind you and you're leading them on the way. And you're just making sure that every step of the way, they're right there behind you and that you're not losing them. And so it's not dumbing down. You're not, you're not saying, you know, you, ha you can't say sophisticated things, but rather it's that as you say those sophisticated things, you need to make sure the person is right there along with you. Another key principle is heart before head. So this image helps us understand this next principle. Here's a picture of a child being passed through barbed wire. And it's a profoundly unsettling kind of image, right? Um, and before you, your mind even often will try to make sense of this, you know, ask yourself, what year was this photo taken? Or, you know, what exactly is going on? Which place in the world is this? Your, your, your heart just is moved, right? To think of the tragedy, whatever tragedy this is, of a child needing to be passed through barbed wire. And so this is the task before us when we're writing for the public, is that we often want to move people with their head before we engage their heart. So how do we do that in writing with words? So here's an example um, from a piece that we've written uh, that was published, excuse me, in, um, in, in Sapiens, and it was written by um, Sophie Chow. And so she begins this piece, the West Papuan village of Kaloyam is home to a cassowary chick that was rescued by community members when it was still an egg. A group of women found the remnants of its nest with three eggs inside and a newly dug irrigation ditch amid the smoldering remains of a forest that had been leveled and burned to make way for an 18,000 hectare oil palm plantation. The woman noticed the nest when they were returning from an unsuccessful fishing trip to the Bayan River, one of the area's largest rivers. There, a slurry of toxic sludge discharged by the local oil palm mill had contaminated the water and killed scores of fish, leaving their poison bodies floating on the surface. The woman carefully carried the three eggs back to the village and incubated them in a large vat of rice. Although two of the eggs rotted away, one held on. Several weeks later, a tiny scraggly chick squirmed its way out of the pale blue-green shell, shell. The villagers named the male, the male cassowary chick Reuben. So this is how the author, Sophie, uh, Dr. Chow, makes a kind of plea to the reader's heart, to their emotions, to pull them into the story, to get them to care. And this is, a, to my mind, one of the most brilliant pieces we have on Sapiens, because I think the surprising twist is that her hero of the story, in a way, her protagonist, is this cassowary chick, Reuben. So rather than it being, you know, a human, rather than it being her, she actually puts at the center of her uh, story this, this abandoned uh, cassowary. Uh, chick named uh, Reuben. And so you're pulled in, you care, you, you're, you understand the drama and the trauma of this moment. And so you're pulled in. Um, but here's the story that 
that Sophie is trying to get to, that this is what she cares about. She says, spurred by the growing global and national demand for food and fuel, this large scale landscape transformation, is part of a broader development scheme called the Morocco Integrated Food and Energy Estate Project, which involves the conversion of up to 2.5 million hectares of forest to palm oil, sugarcane mining, and timber concessions across the region. The effort is just the latest in West Papua's long history of top-down natural resource exploitation. Accurate data on the rates of deforestation in West Papua remain largely elusive, but according to Greenpeace Indonesia, logging, both legal and Ill illegal, and agribusiness plantations are the main drivers of deforestation in the region. Oil palm, oil palm plantations are expanding at a particularly rapid rate. For the Marin, the loss of the forest and its many beings thus represents much more an environmental problem. It radically challenges the possibility of sustaining valued human, non-human connections and gives rise to new kinds of ambiguous interspecies relationships. One of these is pet herd. So the section part, the second part that I've read you here, that is, that's really what she wants you to learn about, right? That's the nugget of what's at stake. This is why she goes to study there. This is, these, these are the things that matter to her. But imagine this piece starting with that second part. I, th I would say a lot of readers would probably not read on past that first part. It is just, it's all facts, it's straightforward, it feels maybe familiar to some of us, um, or even if it's new to us, why should we care? There's nothing at stake for us because we don't have a personal connection to this place and to the story. So what Sophie has done is instead starting with Ruben, she gets us to care, she pulls us in, it's part first, and then once we care, she's able to convince us about um, uh, digging in deeper and understanding why it matters by some of these factual details. So another central part of this is to own your experience. And, you know, this is often a difficult part of of public writing for a lot of us. Um, I think in a lot of cases we are um, trained and probably rightly so to have a certain kind of humility, uh, maybe even especially in anthropology where, you know, we understand that our viewpoint, our way of seeing the world is just one of many, um, that we are just one of many scholars. Often we're working in teams or collaborations or, you know, we're students working with professors Right, so we don't often kind of put ourselves first and foremost in our work. Um, and yet what is so important to recognize is that your individual voice holds power. And this is especially true in public writing where most people, when they read, they want to understand you as the writer. They want to get into your experience, your head, your heart, they want to understand what matters to you, you know, where you've been, the road you've been on, and they want to understand, given all that, what, what it is you have to say. So in popular writing, it is really important to embrace your own experience, your own voice, and recognize the power it has um, and that you can share it. It's also important to recognize your, your own accomplishments. Um, many of you uh, you know, are in uh, graduate programs, you hold uh, faculty positions, or you um, hold other kinds of professional positions, uh, you've published, you've received grants, um, you've uh, studied very hard to get where you are. And often you'll see um, in the kind of writing that's done in, for the public is a kind of nod to our own background. Uh, because the reader wants to understand why it is you have you have a space for them in whatever venue that you're publishing in. Uh, similarly, it's important to recognize your achievements um, that you've um, that you've won, your experiences that you have as an anthropologist as much as a human being. And what's vital about all this is the reader is trying to grasp, and hopefully early on, what it is that you as an author have to teach them. So the example I like to give is that 
I'm personally am really passionate about climate change. Um, it's something I think a lot about. It occupies a lot of my my own headspace. I care a lot about it. You know, I put uh, a lot of my ener personal energy into it. But I have never studied climate change. Um, it's never been a topic um, for various reasons that I've been able to focus on. Uh, I've never published a paper on climate change. I've never won an award on climate change, you know, doing research on climate change, right? So why would anyone want to listen to me talk about climate change in a world particularly of so many experts around it, right? Um, but compare that to, uh, for example, my work as a museum curator. Okay, so I've done a lot of work as a museum curator. And um, if I am writing about museums, I need to be able to embrace my experiences and quickly convey to the uh, reader that I have some authority, I have some expertise that helps validate my arguments, my experience. Um, so I was hoping that we would early, you know, have the chance to do some, some introductions. Um, and I'm going to start again with a different kind of introduction. And we'll see if anyone volunteers to do this. Um, but the, this is another activity that I think, you know, even if we don't, it'd be great if we can get some volunteers, but if we can't, that's fine too. And it's just something for you to think about in for yourself as well. Um, and so the, the activity here is to um, say your name and then what you are an expert in and why. Okay. So, you know, my typical academic introduction would be something like, you know, my name is Chip Caldwell, I'm the editor in chief of Sapiens, and I live and work in Denver, Colorado. Note how Gideon, uh, in his gracious introduction, uh, he listed many of my accomplishments, right? And to me, that's a little embarrassing, you know, frankly, but I understand it also helps establish my expertise and authority so that hopefully, you know, as we're going through this workshop, you understand that I'm coming from a place of experience, right? So it's the same thing in our public writing. So let's say I am uh, going to say I'm an expert on uh, repatriation. So I'm going to explain um, explain that. So it'd be this is how it goes. My name is Chip Caldwell, and I am an expert on repatriation, the return of human remains and sacred objects from museums to Native American peoples. I am an expert in this because for 12 years, I oversaw the museums, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, one of the United States' largest natural history museums. I oversaw its repatriation program for 12 years. Through this work, I received three major awards. I wrote a popular book uh, through the University of Chicago Press that won six major prizes. Um, I'm an, also an invited speaker at universities uh, around the world about the topic of repatriation, and I'm actively working with Native tribes to reclaim sacred items and their ancestors from museums around the world. So with that introduction, hopefully, again, it's totally awkward, I hate saying it, but like if I then followed up that statement about something about repatriation, you might be inclined to, to at least acknowledge the expertise that I've earned over a lifetime, right? So it's the same thing with all of you. All of you are either, you know, have experiences as an anthropologist, you're either building an expertise or you have one if, if you've, you know, moved on in your career. Um, and so in our popular writing, we need to be able to convey some of these, um, and it's not a laundry list of your awards or your degrees or anything like that. Um, it's the way this activity translates into writing is a kind of acknowledgement of whatever it is. So often, like in op-eds, you will say, you know, as an expert in blah, blah, you know, as an expert in repatriation, you know, I've done this for, for 20 years and I'm, I have this to say or that sort of thing. Um, or, you know, if you're basing it on your field research, I have worked in this community for this many years and uh, it's important uh, to, um, to acknowledge, you know, the work that's uh, been accomplished or something like that, right? So with that, um, I was wondering if we have any um, any volunteers that are willing to give this a shot. It can be an expertise uh, for the sake of this activity. In the academic field, it could be a hobby. 
It could be, um, you know, you're an expert at being a mother or father. Um, you know, there's many kinds of expertise, right? So it's just an activity to try to try to loosen up our our humility that often we have in our field, so that we can uh, begin to acknowledge um, our own expertise. Any takers? Maybe not, but this is, um, so hopefully, again, you can just do this in your own mind. Think about what it is that you are an expert in or you're working to be an expert in and embrace what, what is the work is that you've accomplished. And so that when we're writing for the public, we're able to, um, to give a nod to that so we convince our readers, um, the people that we're trying to work with, um, that we have a voice that really matters. Okay. Next is um, in, in writing for the public, um, I often advise that we get to share one big idea. So in our academic writing, you know, you might in an 8,000 word paper, you know, you might have the chance to talk about methods, might be able to talk about some theory, you might be able to have some, you know, uh, some some new research, you know, the actual evidence that you present, right? So you can have lots of ideas often packed into an 8,000 word paper. And books, of course, you have even much longer. But when we're talking about writing for the public, you really have to choose one from those many, many ideas. And the reasons include short attention spans of the public, um, most in the public domain, um, you know, again, have many choices of ways of being entertained, of ways to learn about the world. And uh, as soon as they start to lose interest in your idea, what it is you're writing, they're going to move on to the next one. Also tight word count. So again, with academic papers, you might have 8,000 8, words. For an opinion piece in a newspaper, you might have 700 if you're lucky. Uh, even longer essays, the longest essays we write tend to be around 2,000 words. Um, and that's really when you start to give, like you saw with Sophie's piece, you know, a 500 word introduction, um, you know, 500 word explanation of what's going on. You basically have kind of a thousand words to play with from there. So you really, really don't have a lot of words um, to, to, um, to use. Another reason is as we already talked about, is simplicity over complexity, right? We want to be simple and straightforward in writing with the public. Uh, we, we're not trying to over uh, make things over complex. And so um, that's also another reason. When thinking about how to actually do this or what that actually means in storytelling, um, you might think about a movie, you know, series like Star Wars, right? It's what I've I forget, seven, nine movies long, I think now, something like that, right? You have all these ins and outs, you have all these different characters, right? Different planets, different centuries. And yet, Star Wars is a story of the triumph of good over evil. That's the story, right? So even though you can have all these characters and ins and outs and, you know, fly across space and time, the story itself, the heart of the story, can be summarized in a very short sentence. Another example would be like The Lord of the Rings, if you're familiar with that movie, where, again, very complicated, ton of characters, ton of geographies, and yet that is about the corrupt corruption of uh, the the uh, the corrupting effects of power, right? The corrupting effects of power. That's all that movie is about. So similarly. Uh, in our own writing for the public, you might think about this in a similar way. You know, you're going to have different characters, you have different places, you're telling multiple stories, but what is the one big idea, uh, like the corrupting effects of power, good over evil, right? You should be able to come down with kind of a, a, a focused, central idea, a single idea that you're going to be able to share. And so this is very hard, um, something I think is maybe even the hardest part of the entire process of writing for the public, but I think it's, it's fundamentally necessary uh, because 
again, as I mentioned, you want someone to be able to walk away from your piece and be able to tell their neighbor, their friend, um, their family, what it is that they just read about. And if you, it's, if you can't even articulate what your one central idea is, your reader probably is not gonna be able to do that either. Okay, number seven here is tell a story. And so this is um, another exercise that um, maybe I'll just do since I think um, that seems to be the inclination. Uh, the um, exercise here is to take this two sentence uh, paragraph, uh, which is a story about baseball, and try to explain this to someone who knows nothing at all about baseball. So um, I'll give you just, I'm going to just give you all a moment, just about 10 seconds here, just to think about if you're familiar at all with baseball, even if you're not deeply familiar with it, how is it that you would explain this paragraph? How would you explain baseball to someone who knows nothing at all about baseball? So the instinct here for most people is to try to break this down, this, this paragraph down, and to try to explain it to people, sort of piece by piece, rule by rule. And so you would start out saying, so in the bottom of the ninth, so in baseball, there's nine innings, typically, unless there's a tied score. And an inning constitutes one turn of the home team and one team of the visiting team. And then they each get three outs. Well, an out happens when the hitter hits the ball and it's caught in the air or it's uh, hit within the, 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 the field and someone catches the ball and they throw them out at first. Well, okay, there's actually four bases and you need to round each base. Um, you need to get through each base. And so you see where I'm going with this. You kind of, people's reaction is to try to break down all of the complexities piece by piece by piece. And that's entirely understandable and natural. Um, and that's what we often try, the first instinct is for a lot of us in trying to under, explain our research to the public is we try breaking down our research. So you might begin by saying like, okay, I'm writing about colonialism. Well, colonialism is the extraction of resources from by one people taken from another people. And this is the historical phenomena that has happened for the last 500 years and previously in other kinds of contexts. Um, and you know, the effects of this are detrimental for these reasons. And now there's a movement to decolonize uh, you know, different sorts of institutions and global effects uh, by these ways. So you're kind of like, right, here's the, the parallels. You're breaking down like that term and those concepts um, piece by piece by piece. So here for the baseball example is how you, I think is you more effectively solve this. Okay. So they say the game was almost over and the home team was losing to its most hated rival. The beloved captain of the home team playing in his last season made a last ditch effort to win. He took a big risk and it looked like it might pay off. But when his teammates tried to help him score, the key player on the other team shut them down. The game ended, the home team went down to bitter defeat. So what you see here, there's no explanation of the rules. There's no explanation, right, of any of the details. You know, the players, Jeter and Teixeira, they're not even mentioned, right? What this person has done is they've stepped way, way back and they've told a story. They've told a story that has nothing to do with the rules. This is almost a, a kind of classic story, right, of two rivals, um, you know, and there comes down to the very last moment, and then one wins and one goes to home and defeat. And so you might think about this in our writing as well, right? So if, you know, to continue with that example, you know, the popular example, if we're talking about colonialism or decolonization, rather than starting by explaining those terms, maybe you tell a story, 
right? Maybe you tell a story about, um, you know, it's more of like a David and Goliath story um, that you share about a community and its battle against uh, an extractive industry, for example, or something, right? Or a museum's effort to um, bring in and welcome new kinds of communities, right? Um, so you don't need to go to all the details to pull in a popular reader. What you need to do is often go the other direction, not zooming into the details, but you're pulling back out to tell them the biggest story possible. And this is really important because storytelling is a deeply human way for us to share experiences and dreams and knowledge, right? Like many of us, I'm guilty as much as anyone, you know, we don't often remember dates or details and numbers, right? Like with Sophie Chow's piece that we just read about, how many people remember the, uh, you know, how many hectares in that scheme that was, that she was talking about, but we all remember Reuben, right? So we care about stories that involve people and places and things that are about good and evil, um, that are about heroes and villains. Those are the things that stick with us and stay with us um, much more than numbers and facts and figures and rules, especially. Great, so we are moving into uh, part two. Um, before we get there, though, I'm very happy to pause. Um, I'm wondering if there are any questions, comments, um, suggestions, get in, feel free to jump in, but also anyone else. We could do it through, I have the chat pulled up if anyone wants to uh, type in any questions, comments, um, or uh, you could also unmute yourself and jump in that way too. I just want to quickly say, Chip, that what you've been saying so far is actually applicable not just to to public writing but to academic writing itself so it's very interesting in terms of getting us to think about the, our purpose and the basics of who we are and what our work is i really appreciate that comment getting because i've i felt that myself that you know i i was doing more kind of basically straight academic writing until 2010 and then I started doing popular writing and I feel that it transformed my academic writing. I think my academic writing became so much better by taking so many of these principles that, you know, you, that you have to apply to popular reading, popular writing. Um, but once you apply them to academic writing, you know, really, can you zero in on a key argument? You know, are you, are you emphasizing clarity above all? You know, are you understanding your reader and what their values are and where they're coming from, right? Are you telling stories? Um, I, I started using anecdotes and stories so much more in my writing, academic writing after doing popular writing, because I see how it works, that you, you're pulled in in a way you wouldn't be otherwise. So you might note, you know, even at this lecture, what did I start with? I started with Jane Goodall's story, right? And I did that very purposefully because I'm hoping that many of you will think about that question of the North Star, but think about it through the lens of Jane Goodall and hope that that stays with you. Much more than me just saying, come up with a North Star, right? So absolutely, I think it affects our academic writing. It can affect our presentations, just the way we talk to each other. I think really all realms of being uh, a scholar, um, public or otherwise, um, these principles can apply. Great. Um, so a question here. Um, I would just like to probe on the principle of heart overhead and relate this with the usual journalistic style of capitalizing on sensationalism to generate audience appeal. How do we make sense between sensationalism and upholding heart overhead to provide informative comment? Great question. And, you know, absolutely, you know, I, I think uh, when we're trying to engage broad publics, we're often tempted to sensationalize because it works, right? If we know it works, you know, if, if there's something that's just profoundly unsettling, if there's some horrible event, um, you know, it works. It's a way to get people to care, to get them to, 
to want to read on. Um, but as anthropologists often working with communities and in communities, um, there's a ethical commitment, right, to not merely uh, or not only sensationalize or not sensationalize at all. Maybe we're trying to go against stereotypes. Maybe we're trying to resist, you know, maybe there's a community that suffered years of violence. And so if you start a story that just, you know, maybe it's a very good story, but it's very violent then it's reaffirming people's biases about that community. Like, oh, it's just another story about, you know, violence in that community, right? So we do have a responsibility and obligation to bring our anthropological sensibilities to the, this task. So I think what I encourage people to do is to find um, those stories that do capture the heart, um, but that also are informed by our other kind of ethical commitments as anthropologists. And it doesn't have to be sensational. Maybe it's an intimate moment. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a kind of uh, unseen moment that you had doing ethnographic research. Maybe you're an archeologist and it's you digging something up and touching this artifact that hasn't been touched in a thousand years and it's a personal connection for you, right? Maybe it is a conversation that you've had with a colleague or someone in the community that you're studying. So to me, it's less about coming up with the most sensationalist, sensationalistic story, and more is it what's the most moving story. It's really about trying to get people to care. And there's all kinds of ways of telling stories. So the, really the takeaway is, is, is to tell those stories, to embrace storytelling, and to um, and to try to use those stories as a way to get people to care um, in a place, a people, a topic, uh, before having to just throw out all the, the the facts and the details, which often are necessary. It's not that you don't have those, but it's that you um, get people to care before you can get them to care about um, all the facts and everything else. So I hope that, feel free to react to that too, if that doesn't quite uh, answer your question, but ho hopefully that does. Um, and I see um, Skilti, uh, looks like you have a question or comment. Hi, yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, about the um, incentivization of popular writing in the US, um, because in the Philippines, there's a pretty good structure in universities to reward um, academics who write in Scopus journals, et cetera. Not so much um, for those who prefer to write in, in magazines and newspapers. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Gideon can answer this as well, but maybe in, in, your, in your case, in your country, how are academics uh, incentivized or rewarded for writing uh, in, in popular style? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a great comment because it's, I think it's quite similar we're currently, um, the reward system is not geared towards public communication. Um, so I have a couple of thoughts about this. You know, one is, I believe it, at least in the United States and definitely in Europe as well, um, and I would hope other parts too, it is changing. I think we are seeing a shift. It's just very, it's a very slow shift. Um, I think there's a lot of pressure on universities to demonstrate their value um, to society at large. And so deans and other administrators, I think, are increasingly seeing public communication as a way to demonstrate their worth, you know, whether it's, you know, the, with the various kinds of support that society often gives to universities and academic institutions. And, you know, I've had, an, it's anecdotal, but, you know, a number of our sapien scholars or writers will say, you know, for example, my dean, you know, I published hundred academic articles, my dean never once noticed what I've written. And after my Sapiens article, my dean reached out to me and congratulated me and said, oh, I didn't realize that's what you were studying, you know? And I think it's because often deans and academic, you know, administrators, they don't have the one time often to read like, you know, really detailed academic work. And then two, they may not even understand it themselves because they're probably coming from other disciplines. So one of, I think, what we see it as a way to communicate with very broad publics, but often, often, often 
the Sapiens articles and these other kinds of public pieces, it's a way to communicate even within the academy. And similarly, I have a lot of anthropologists that will tell me, like, you know, they're cultural anthropologists, but they'll say they can follow sapiens because they can actually learn what's going on in archaeology or linguistics or biological anthropology. Because they're not read, you know, most of us get pretty specialized, so we're not reading across all different types of anthropology. So, you know, I think it also serves that function. I think also, you know, when I read up sapiens, my vision of it was for it to be a magazine of the Wenner Grand Foundation, precisely because of the foundation's um, sort of uh, esteem that it's held within many parts of the of the world as a major funder of anthropology. And so, you know, I think so when people write for us, they can say, you know, not only this is Sapiens, but it's of the Wenner Grand Foundation, which hopefully helps a little. And then finally, acknowledging that people are contributing time, uh, we, we provide an honorarium um, for writers. And currently it's at 150 US dollars, and it's gonna go up to 250 next year. So there's also an incent, you know, another form of an incentivizing people because we recognize you know, that for many academics, this, there is some trade-offs there. And so we really wanna honor their time and what they do. And I would mention that many, not all, but many popular venues do do offer payments. Um, and they're very modest often, but still it is something um, that I think can be another incentive. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I don't know, Gideon, and let's see. Yeah, please, for a moment. Gideon, I but, wanted to hear. Yeah, I'd love to know your own experience, that. Gideon, yeah, in, in response to that question. Yeah, and unfortunately, especially in the Philippines, um, because also of the the challenges that are faced by outlets. For example, Philippine Daily Inquirer used to pay, is to give a, a very small honorarium, uh, 1,000 pesos, I think, for commentaries. But now they said that for the past two years, they weren't able to do that anymore. So it's even less. So I, I think that it's not really a it's not really a an incentive at least i don't see it i don't feel it as a mm -hmm. an incentive to, to write the financial aspect is not there uh of course it's very welcome that like for sapiens they give a an honorarium and of course that's most welcome but otherwise it's really more for the being able to share your work rather than anything else and even outlets like Al Jazeera and other uh, international oftentimes they also don't uh, they also don't uh, compensate so but that's a very good thing to raise because there's a question here of of labor as well and and, and what we can do what how mm -hmm. can we, we can incentivize people to to write more so I'm glad mm -hmm. that you also raised that mm -hmm. thank you I think on that, to pick up that one of your points there, Gideon, you know, there's also just the, the joys and pleasure of seeing your ideas and your writing widely read. You know, I think, you know, for me, I definitely you just have this kind of thrill, you know, right, when you, your ideas kind of matter and people are talking about them and, and you feel like you're contributing to debates that are important to the world. One of our other columnists, Steve Nash, he, um, after about his after his millionth reader came, you know, he's he's written about 50 pieces, so many, many pieces, but he's now had a million readers. And on his millionth reader, he basically told me I'm not going to write academic stuff anymore <laughs> because his academic stuff is read by he knows, you know, uh, six, maybe seven people sometimes. <laughs> and he spends just as much time, more time writing, you know, his academic stuff. So he's he's almost completely converted to writing for the popular audiences because he sees so much more impact you know in his work and he's in a secure position where he's he has the luxury and privilege of doing that so it's very different from many anthropologists but nonetheless you know it's just to say there's the additionally to the merits of uh, that we get you know for writing for the public there's also just more the personal professional um pleasure and experience you can bring to just to quickly add to that chip one of the rewards is really being also from sapiens is being translated sometimes i'm surprised that to see some of my essays being translated in spanish or portuguese so the ability to reach different languages also uh 
is there and that's very I find it very rewarding. Mm -hmm. Thank you for mentioning that. It looks like we have another question here. Um, so this question comes from Eli. Uh, one challenge in the Philippines is the limited number of popular periodicals that accommodate the style of writing, especially in local media and local publications in the regions and even in periodicals and magazines in Manila that are mainly in English. These few periodicals have mainly tended to accept only articles that they think would generate a wide audience, which should translate into high ratings or business sponsorship or media. This is perhaps the fear that scholars may be required to sensationalize, which many find offend offending or offensive. Yeah, your comment on this, please. Yes, a very good point. You know, I think different parts of the world obviously have different numbers of venues and the, just the raw number of opportunities to be able to write for the public. Um, so definitely, I think we need to acknowledge the limitations. I think on the second point, um, I appreciate that insight. And the way um, you can approach, one, one way to approach this, I think, is to use what writers will call, a, journalists will call a hook or a news hook that will speak to the moment or that will pull people in because it's a topic of conversation very broadly because of some news event it's some anniversary of some historic event right and you use that hook just to pull people in enough and then you get to tell your story about what it is um, so for example one thing that that i've done before is you know i've written some op-eds some opinion articles about repatriation and basically you can write almost the bottom three quarters of your article and you say what you want to say. It's your ideas. It, it is, you know, what it is I wanted to tell. And it's just the top fourth that you use to wait until there's something that happens in the news that you can use as a hook to show that it's timely. And you're often doing this for readers, but you're often doing this for editors too. Because mo as you point out, most editors, they're looking for something that's happening right now that people are talking about and that a lot of people are talking about. And frankly, you know, some anthropologists do study things that, you know, people widely will talk about, but often we're studying some corner of society or some corner of the world or some corner of history. So you can wait, you know, until there's some big moment. So for example, in the US, when the Black Lives Matter movement really took off, that was a moment to talk about inequities and the unequal treatment of different people in US society and beyond. So I could take that current event, you know, something that was happening right then and sort of attach it to the bottom three quarters of what it is I was gonna wanted to say all along. Um, you could say that's a form of sensationalizing, but I think to me, it's really more a strategy of making your research relevant to the moment and to broad publics. And I think as long as you're doing that, again, within kind of your ethical commitments to the communities that you work in, that you feel you're not, you know, lying or, you know, over dramatizing something, um, as long as you're staying true to those other commitments, I think that's a way for you to navigate um, that, that way to um, say what it is you want to say based on your research, but also speak to the moment um, that that uh, many people might be talking about um, in broader society. So let's move on, um, but please do keep your questions coming. Um, let's, you know, as they come up, if I say something that uh, you'd like to comment on, uh, any questions, please do. I'll keep the chat up here so I keep an eye on that. Um, and then uh, and Gideon, let me know if I miss any, uh, please, and uh, or raise your hand. Please do jump in. Okay, part two is the pitch. So in many um, outlets and magazines, and again, Gideon, you, maybe you could speak to the Philippine context, I'd be really interested. In many outlets in North America and Europe, um, you have to do something called a pitch. And basically this is a proposal to the editors about what it is you want to write. Uh, it's kind of nice that it saves everyone time. Editors are really busy. They often don't have time to read a full essay. 
So for them, it's very efficient. They just get a sense of what it is you want to write, who you are, why this matters right now. And then for an anthropologist, it's great because you don't have to go write a 2000 word essay. You just get to write a 200, 300 word pitch. And so it's a much more efficient way for you also to propose ideas for popular writing. I would note that opinion pieces, um, so essays are typically more narrative driven. They have, um, they don't necessarily have a formula. Uh, they can be about 2000 words. Opinion pieces are arguments and they're usually short and pithy and it's you saying, I have something to say about the world and I want the world to change. And so you're doing the work of trying to make arguments and these tend to be quite formulaic, um, usually open with an anecdote or your opening argument. You give three pieces of evidence, you address a counter argument, and then you close. And you do all that in six to 800 words. Um, so opinion pieces, sometimes they do want to see the full written piece um, and you just submit the full opinion article. Uh, but even then with, uh, for example, uh, The Guardian, they still do the pitch process even for opinion pieces. So it can vary quite a bit. But the pitch is a really important part of, um, of writing in many venues. And you need to, it's almost kind of its own skill that you need to master. Before I go on, Gideon, how has how, what's been your experience in, in writing in the Philippines and elsewhere? Well, in, in terms of pitching, I think that my first experience in doing this was with the conversation so it, it was a kind of format where uh what's what are the main points and then was a sample i think sapiens also does the same where you uh you put your like a sample paragraph so it's really challenging it's actually quite challenging for me to make a pitch and until now i don't think I, i've mastered it because it's really challenging to put put your ideas into just one paragraph and to, to summarize them it's a it's a constant struggle but it's very rewarding as well because it's also mm -hmm. right itself it helps you write the whole piece in itself i totally agree on all those points and so yeah so yes yeah, so the conversation is another really amazing venue i definitely encourage you to look at it um, i published there a few times and love their editors and their process and i think on the second point get in you're exactly right with um Again, all of these things help you, <laughs> you know, they, it's kind of, it's, a, it's hard work and this is a, a new skill that is going to be very unfamiliar to many of you, it was to me, um, but it really helps you. It, it helps you zero in on what it is you want to say and how it is you're going to say it and why it matters. And if you know the answer to all of those and you can put them in words, not only is that going to convince an editor, then you have most of your work already done for you for the writing because you know it, what it is you want to say, you know how it is you're going to say it, and you know why it matters. So to help you build, start building some skills in this craft, um, I would point you to this website. It's called The Open Notebook, where they have a lot of example pitches. And these are real pitches that were published, that led to successful publications in a lot of different um, publications. Now, these are mostly journalists writing for uh, these these outlets, but the pitch is a pitch. You know, this is a skill, no matter whether you're a journalist or an anthropologist, that you can use um, as a way to uh, write for um, these these different magazines and newspapers. So at Sapiens, uh, we also use a pitch process, as Gideon mentioned. Uh, we do this as a way to make sure the anthropologists really know it is what it is they want to say. Um, and it's a way for us also to vet. The reality is we'd love to be able to publish everybody, um, but the reality is we just don't have the editorial staff size um, to be able to do that. So I would say probably about one out of every four pitches um, is accepted um, at um, Sapiens, um, which is fairly competitive, but you know, you, you have a good shot at it for sure. And it's actually much better than probably other venues. Um, some of course are extremely difficult, like the New York Times, which, you know, it's like 0.001% chance. You know, they just received hundreds and hundreds of, of pitches and opinion pieces that they aren't able to publish. So um, I think the different thing about Sapiens too, is that we 
want to publish amazing writing, but we also want to help anthropologists learn how to write amazingly. So, you know, it's part of our mission is not only to do the publication part, but it's also due to the guidance part, the mentor part, um, the help part. So in other words, we encourage everyone to pitch, um, but we also understand this might be the first time you're ever doing this. So if we don't accept it, we try to give some feedback if we can. Um, and then if your pitch is accepted, often there still even is uh, work to be done um, to put in practice some of those principles that we've been talking about. So for Sapiens, um, if you're interested in pitching, you would first go through um, our website and then you go through a, a portal called Submittable. And you need to fill out like just some of the basics, so the background of who you are. And then you have your pitch, which is a 350 word limit. Um, we allow a space for any additional comments for us to consider. And then um, we have the opportunity for you to talk about your background or your perspective that might help us with our goal to bring um, historically, mar uh, historically marginalized voices forward. So the pitch, this 350 word pitch, that's really what we're gonna focus on here now um, for the rest, because that's really the heart of it. That's really what matters most um, to the Sapiens staff as well as most every other editor. So a really, good pitch will have these three elements. Um, first, you should be able to summarize the article's key point or its argument in a sentence or two, right? So it's that, it's that good versus evil or the corrupting effects of power, right? Can you zero in on what it is you wanna say in just a, a short, clear way? Then you should be able to summarize the article's narrative structure in less than 300 words. So that's, you should be able to give a sense of the flow of the article, you know, is there a beginning, is there a middle, uh, middle, and then what would be your end? Finally, the pitch should have a flavor of the writing style itself. So if what you're writing is kind of light and humorous, your piece, need, your pitch needs to be light and humorous. If you're writing something very serious and you're making forceful arguments, you need to use that same kind of language in the pitch itself. So the pitch is kind of a mini presentation of what the article, what the article is or what you envision it to be. So I'm gonna give everyone just uh, a minute or so to read this pitch. Um, this is a real pitch, a bit modified, but basically a pitch that came to us at Sapiens. And um, hopefully this gives you a sense of what this looks like in practice. So I'll give you that minute now. Okay, so I hope you notice just even in this pitch, some of the principles that we've already talked about, right? Maybe, could you put it maybe in the chat if anyone, what, what do you observe? Are there any, anyone wants to volunteer a few things that some of these initial principles we've learned, what do you see here, even, even just the pitch itself? You could also raise a hand or, or speak up too, but chat's better for, for you all. The big moment is an opportunity, yeah. 
Yeah. Very nice. The author's expertise is there, exactly, right? This is someone who's right there in the middle of it. Like, this is someone who, you know, if we're looking for an expert, someone's voice and authority about archaeology at Woodstock, this is the person that we want to speak on it, right? Anything else? I think another key element for me is the um, the storytelling, right? Oh, Dara, thank you for joining us. Let's see. Uh, she wanted to publish an article on how archaeology informs cultural memory. Yeah, so very clear, right? Her point. You understand it. You grasp it. You you kind of get it, right? Um, it's, it's a very clear point. Um, I was also going to say about storytelling, right? Um, she starts off with a story. She is there digging away and so you're put in this place and time um with uh with this person as they are doing the work um so you can see even in the pitch you know obviously the article you hope has all these elements but even the pitch you see some of these principles being put in place now in terms of a pitch itself it's important to have these elements right so this first is, why you? Why are you the person to write this? Um, as noted, um, I think she establishes her credentials. Another element here is, so what? Why should this matter? Why should the public care about this? And then thirdly, why now? Why is it readers are going to want to read this right now? It kind of goes back to that last comment, right? Can an editor sell this to the public as something that matters? Is there something in the news about this? Are people talking about this, right? So those are typically the three most basic questions an editor is going to be thinking about with a pitch. Why you? So what? And why now? So you need to be able to answer that somewhere in the pitch, as well as these other, <laughs> these other principles. So you understand why Gideon's point about why this is so hard, right? Because you need to say a lot. You're packing a lot in there. Those three questions plus all those principles, you're trying to tell a story, you're trying to give a sense of the narrative structure, right? You're trying to do all of that in 300 or so words. So it is a very difficult task, but a really important one. Okay. So I would invite now any of you, hopefully, you know, you've attended this workshop with some interest, maybe in writing for the public or sharing the stories about the public. Um, are there any, um, does anyone want to try to offer a, a very informal pitch? You know, even just share kind of what you're thinking about, then maybe, you know, I'm happy to give some informal feedback and in how you might approach it. Um, any, anyone willing to, or interested in, in getting uh, some, having conversation around a possible pitch that you've been thinking about? Gideon, can I ask you, how, how is it you come up with your ideas for articles? What, what's your process? Actually, I've struggled to, to, to think of ideas lately, but if no one else is, is going to uh, pitch an idea, I'd like to, to just uh, think out loud here, because I'm now thinking about pitching an article about, about running. and about Because I recently completed this Mexico City Marathon, last week congratulations yeah. yes thank you uh it was a struggle but but i i, I made it and it got me thinking about this long anthropological literature on the techniques of the self and how people have written about even walking as a technique and so i was thinking that maybe i can put together something about what anthropology can teach us about running mm -hmm. And vice versa. Like, what can we learn about about modernity and mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. physicality, body projects mm -hmm. by looking yeah. at the marathons? Perfect. 
Yeah, so obviously a rich topic. And so, you know, often the work that we do in forming a pitch is what journalists will say going from a topic to a story. You know, a topic is kind of what you summarized there, Gideon, which is, you know, what we're interested in, right? You know, running as an anthropological topic, you know, as an anthropological subject. Um, but what story is it that we could tell? So, you know, with you, Gideon, I think, you know, just to tease this apart a little bit, you just finished a marathon, right? Um, you, I imagine you said it was hard. So, you know, I can imagine a opening that is, you know, there I was, mile 23 and a half, and my legs started shaking and, you know, I'm making this up, of course, but, you know, and I was struggling and was I going to make it? And in that moment, you know, it made me, it helped me think about, you know, uh, running as a cultural phenomenon, right? And then you pull back and you talk about what is the topic or argument you want to make. And then maybe you kind of conclude with, you know, and I finished, right? And so there's this kind of nice going to be arc to it where it's like your personal story, you add a little drama to it, you can pull back, talk about the anthropology, and then you, you let the editor know there can be a, like a happy conclusion there at the end, right? So that would be, you know, just without knowing a lot of the details, of course, that's a way, right? We're going from, here's something I'd like to write about, to like, how do you actually structure the pitch? So you have an anecdote, pulling back, telling your argument, and then a conclusion, something like that. Would something like that work for you, do you think, Gideon, as a, both the pitch as an, and an article? Yeah, and I might actually do it. Uh, Great, I, I'm yeah. really thinking about it. So thank yeah. you for, for sharing <laughs> your thoughts. Absolutely. I would invite any, anyone else. Anyone else want to share some things they've been thinking about, maybe some topics or um, you know, what, what it is you might be motivated to write on? Great, okay, so we have um, in the chat here um, from, from Eli, if I'm pronouncing that correct. Um, some ideas come from the sounds I hear, especially sounds that I've tended to ignore. This pandemic has given me time to pause. Surprisingly, those brief moments of pause have prompted me to train my ear back to the many sounds around me that for me, before the pandemic, were merely noise. Now I'm trying to separate one sound from another rearrange them in my thoughts, reassemble them with the images I see around me, and I derive new insights. What is the sound of this pandemic, at least from someone having this luxury of a pause? Really, really thoughtful um, idea there. And um, I can appreciate uh, sort of the anthropology of the senses, I think is sort of driving um, this, this idea. And, um, so I think, again, it's the, the, the challenge of a pitch is taking the idea here and making it more specific. So I think, you know, is there a particular sound, you know, in your experience over the last year and a half that maybe you've you ignored before, but now you're hearing it every day? Or was there a moment where you suddenly had this revelation? And so can you turn that into a story, right? Um, and not a big one, but just a moment, an anecdote to pull us in, to really give us a sense of that, of your internal experience. I then think um, with, with this sort of topic, pulling the pulling back part, you probably need to elaborate a little more and think about you know, some anthropological theory or some idea, a concept, it would really give some meat to this, you know, because I, I really appreciate what you're saying here as a personal experience. But I think we'd also want to hear from you as an anthropologist, you know, what is this, what is there to learn from this? Um, is it, you know, I'm making this up, but maybe it's like, um, you know, being aware of this sense has helped you understand how we often are closed off from other cultures because we have our own lenses and we're interpreting you know, the world through those lenses. But when you open up those lenses, you suddenly can experience other cultures in a different way, right? Or maybe there's a very specific concept in the anthropology of the senses that you, you know, one big idea that you would bring forward to share just to explain what that idea is to the, to the general public, right? Um, so you definitely, that's like really 
a great, great, great uh, framing, I think, for a piece. I think it would just be a matter of finding the right pieces, you know, the anecdote, and then what is the one big idea you really want to share as an anthropologist? What is it that you could bring forward um, that maybe is unseen or unheard or, you know, unknown by, by other readers? I hope that that provides some, some, uh, yeah. And then uh, to continue, it is the sound of a siren in the middle of the night, then the everyday death, then my mortality, and then perhaps everyone contemplating about their everyday deaths while living and while trying to live. That sound before was plainly the sound of an ambulance rushing to the hospital, minus the death only the rush. The price I'm creating something now. Thanks. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think that's also, you know, to me, it's almost back to that conversation about sensationalizing or not. And to me, that's not, that's the reality, right? It's not sensationalizing. That's the tragic, tragic reality of the pandemic. So um, I think just acknowledging that and being frank with your readers is not sensationalizing. So I think, and yet that could move them. You know, I think, why should we care? Why should we care about these sounds? Well, these are the sounds of death you know, these are the sounds of a pandemic. So I think a lot is at stake there. So I think drawing that out and really letting your editor and reader know, this isn't just noise, this is this is our world, experience through noise, um, I think would be really important. Thank you for offering that idea and some of those thoughts. Do you have anyone else like to step forward? Okay, let's um, move on to the next slide here. So really practically then, oh, and by the way, I should have mentioned, um, I'm very happy to share this PowerPoint slide with the organizers. So for anyone who liked these as notes later on, I'm happy to do that. Um, so the sort of step-by-step -step process here is to begin by mapping out your article idea. It's kind of like what we just did, right? You have a topic, you have something, a dream of, you know, some idea, some concept that you want to share with publics or, or different kinds of readers. So then you have to map that out. You know, what is that really, what's your big idea? What is the narrative structure? You know, why does this matter? What's at stake? Then you really want to work to find the right publishing fit. You know, so if your audience is strictly in the Philippines, you know, maybe you're looking at local or national publications. Um, if you're trying to speak to anthropology writ large and anthropological publics, maybe you're looking internationally, right? And you really want to find um, the tone too, right? If, if a newspaper only publishes extremely serious topics and you're trying to do something a little more lighthearted, it's not going to be right fit. So you're trying to find the fit between your article idea and the publication itself. And so at, once you've found kind of the general publication that's good for you. You then want to study the publication's guidelines. So almost all publications will say, here's how you pitch us, here's how you write for us, make sure you follow those. You then want to draft your pitch um, and following those guidelines. And sometimes you might have an email in addition to the pitch itself um, that, that will give you a chance to really spell out to an editor, why me, why now, and so what. So if you have that chance to not just have the 300 word pitch, but also email, take advantage of that, just to spell out to editors a little more about what it is you're trying to do. You might have a non-scholar, non-anthropologist friend read your pitch. Um, does it make sense to them as a non-anthropologist? You then wanna finalize your pitch with no typos or grammatical errors. Um, I actually noticed there was a grammatical error uh, typo in the pitch I shared with you, so apologies for that. But Try not to do what I just did uh, and share uh, um, a pitch with, no, with none of that. Uh, then you submit and you wait. Um, and typically you can follow up once if you don't hear back, um, but otherwise you move on. And it's really important in this work to embrace um, the fact that success will require some failure. Um, very few people are successful with their pitches the very first time. 
And even after you've done it for a long time, I've been doing it for 10 years and I'm still regularly getting rejections. In fact, I get many more rejections than I get uh, acceptances. And it's just the fact is there's many people who want to write for the public and um, there aren't that, you know, there are many venues, but still not enough. And it's very competitive. It can be very competitive. What's really important, what keeps me going and is I'm able to just sort of ignore the failures in a way is that um, you never know why you, you almost never know why it is a magazine or newspaper did not accept your, your piece. It could be, you know, just simply maybe they loved your pitch, but they're actually publishing an article just like that in a week from when you pitched. So they don't want to cover the same topic twice, right? Maybe um, they love your idea, but they actually want a journalist to cover it because they want, you know, someone to cover kind of both sides of a debate, right? So there's all kinds of reasons. And again at sapiens we do try to at least give one one or two reasons if we decline uh, but many other publications won't do that so you just kind of have to accept that um you know success requires uh, not having success often when you're pitching and so you just accept that and then you move on to the next publication and try again So with that, I'm very happy to take some more questions. I see there is one more um, in the uh, chat, which I'll get to in a second. Um, how much time do we have left here? Yeah, about 15 minutes. So I'm happy to take some more questions. In addition to this last one, please put more in there. Um, <clears throat> please do consider me a resource. If you have any follow-up questions, uh, if you'd like to talk further, I'm really happy to meet one-on-one -on -one or in small groups, uh, whatever it might be. I'm also, you know, if this is useful to you. Um, I'd be really happy to meet at future conferences, um, or we could organize a you know, special online workshop as part of uh, the organization's work. Whatever is useful to you. I would just love to sort of build a partnership and relationship with um, anthropologists um, as part of UGAT and um, see, see what we can do. So I really appreciate the organizers um, for this invitation, this chance to, to begin this work. Uh, so let's see here. So the pitch then um, can be used for introductions in academic writing, particularly those with anthropological or ethnographic tone. I, I think so. You know, there's often um, quite a bit of overlap in your academic writing uh, as much as uh, your popular writing. There's different ways of thinking about this. One way is if you are publishing an academic piece, you might consider publishing that first because in an academic article, you'll have all of your evidence laid out, you'll have all of your ideas, you know, really well formed. And I personally find it's easier to translate kind of all of that, especially after it's been through peer review, if you go through peer review, right? You know, it's been vetted by your colleagues. You have every, all the parts are there. So then it's just a matter of reassembling those parts for a popular audience. So that they understand, uh, you know, your core idea, your evidence, and so on. But you're just translating the academic idea to a popular idea. Uh, but it's certainly possible to go the other way. Um, you know, for maybe you have a very timely idea. Maybe your research is pointing to something that's like happening right now in the news, and so you really want to jump on it and write a popular piece. And um, that's great. Go for it. And then maybe the anecdotes and your core idea that come out of your popular article can inform your academic writing. Um, so in short, yes, you know, I see this kind of flow between your academic writing and your popular writing. And you just might think about for yourself and your particular context you're working in, which makes more sense uh, to do the academic writing first and then popular or popular and then academic. Didi, not to pick on you again, what's your process? Do you, do you tend to go uh, from academic to popular or what's, what's your flow there? I think it can be, uh, it can go the other way around as well. But of course, mo I'm most comfortable with topics that I've already written about academically. I want to also uh, share nine with some of the questions that 
uh, that the that the way the sapiens articles are written is that even though there's no citation as such but there's a hyperlink to different sources including you can always refer back to your work for people who want to who want to have a more academic uh, uh, reference but at the same time chip i'd also like to ask you in terms of these uh, references that we're asked to put in the in sapiens uh, i'm sure people if people want to start building an article they might also be interested to know what the process is like in terms of assembling this set of references that are hyperlinked to the mm -hmm. to the articles yes great yeah thank you for that question because we do public you know in all of these venues i've been talking about this is non-fiction right and so we need to provide uh evidence and backing for our factual claims. And so um, we do this at Sapiens and most of these other venues in kind of two ways. One is we include hyperlinks that will link to academic articles, you know, maybe other popular articles, uh, encyclopedia entries, whatever it is that's sort of backing up our factual claims um, and that are necessary for the reading experience. So a claim that a reader would be likely to ask uh, where, you know, where did they get that number from, or could I learn more about this? That's usually the function of those links, you know, within the article itself. But additionally, during our copy edit process, so when our editor is checking for typos and grammatical area errors, that sort of thing, we also do a, a basically a fact check um, for the different factual claims. And for those, we ask our authors to give us sometimes it'll, it'll just be footnotes in a word document so then we can just check to make sure you know we're not publishing anything that's factually incorrect uh, those footnotes though are not included in the published article it's really just a way for us internally to make sure that we can be confident in what we're putting out is factual to the best of our knowledge um, so we have a really, really amazing copy editor um, who does that fact checking for us as well. And um, the, when the author is presenting those footnotes with links or uh, citations, then it just eases the process. And so then we don't have to go searching for the facts ourselves. We know what it is that you're citing. And so it's sort of that two step process. Thanks for raising that. And actually, the, the right, the editor is writer editors really make it much easier. Uh, I feel more comfortable that I'm not being judged or being rejected, but it's more of a, a learning process. That we're working with these editors really make things uh, easier and takes away the intimidation that that normally goes with, with the process. I've worked with a, a couple, at least a couple of editors with Sapiens and I really enjoy working with them. It's great to hear, Gideon. Yeah, I do hope that most of our, all of our writers feel that we're on your side. You know, we are your collaborators and teammates, and we are working to help you succeed as a writer. So I think some people maybe have this concept of it's like, you know, kind of a struggle or a battle, right? Whereas like, we, our Sapiens team are the experts in crafting popular articles that will be read by millions of people. And you're the expert in your area. And when you put those together, you come up with really magnificent articles. So it's a collaboration that we try to communicate, you know, and that we want our writers to know that we're on your side, that we're working together. Let's see here. So we have uh, another question from Eileen. Uh, thank you for being accommodating with our questions. I hope one more is okay, absolutely. Um, for many anthropologists, as mentioned, our worth, value, contribution, it's generally measured in more academic scholarly venues. How do we locate writing for the public as part of our career as professionals? How do we divide our energies in developing the skill versus developing skills that would make us more acceptable to the scientific community? How do we strategically use these different writing skills set to flourish as budding anthropologists? So, yeah, fantastic question. Um, you know, the way I, I've approached it in my in my career to date is uh, kind of pointed to a few questions ago where 
I set out when I write an academic article, my goal is to, because I need that academic article for, you know, all the reasons I think most of us know, you know, to advance professionally as a scholar and a, as an academic. But I set out to have at least one popular uh, public um, uh, outcome from that work as well. And I find it's actually not that much more work because as I was saying, once I have my article, my academic article done, I know what the anecdotes are, you know, I know what my arguments are, I know what the evidence is. It's really just fine tuning and reshaping that academic article to a popular one. So time wise, it's not a huge investment to just go that one more step and take that academic work to translate to a popular piece. Um, so that's for me, I, I do occasionally I get inspired and I'll write just a standalone popular piece or, you know, I'll do you know, some other popular thing for a popular audience, but it's really that taking the research that you've done, you know, you're going to write the academic stuff. So just go one step further and do a popular one. Um, you know, I think um, it's also you helpful, you know, if you take your popular work and you use it uh, as a way to share your work with publics that otherwise might not be aware of what it is you're doing. So, you know, for me, that includes sharing back with the communities where I've done research. Because even when I share my academic articles with them, they may not be able to read it in that thick academic language, but they'll be able to read the popular ones. So to me, that's like an added value, my ethical commitment, as much as my scholarly one of sharing my work back with the communities I've worked in. Um, as I mentioned, you know, share it with your colleagues in your your, with other faculty members, with your deans, with administrators, right? Um, you know, a lot of people, I think, when they write in Sapiens or these other popular venues, they might think their work is done once it once it's published. But in many ways, my view, it's just begun because you need to, you know, gently and with humility, but, you know, you, it's, it's helpful. You've just done all this work to publish a popular thing. Let's get it out in the world. So how is it you can strategically place it in different kinds of audiences that matter to you. And maybe it's not going to matter in the same way for tenure or, that, or getting a job, academic job, but it's going to matter for can you keep working with that community? Will the community care about your work? You know, do your colleagues around you understand you? Um, you know, can colleagues outside the Philippines understand what it is, the work that you're doing? You know, your, if you publish in, in like local journals that may not get out in the same way like Sapiens would get out, um, where it's, you know, again, a kind of global audience, right? So I think there's these kind of like intangible benefits you just really have to embrace and then really being able to do the work to make sure that it's having that impact. We have a question um, from Dara. Uh, I hope you don't mind me. I'm reading this. Um, I'm an anthropology undergraduate. Any advice on how to overcome the fear of writing the first draft to create a writer's block? Yeah. I hear you. You know, there's um, a lot of anxiety for many of us that goes into writing. You know, it is um, scary for lots of reasons. You know, um, it is, it's, uh, you know, fear of failure, you know, fear of rejection fear of saying the wrong thing, right? There's a lot of fears, you know, that I think can underpin writing. And I've been there, I think anyone who's written, you know, can sympathize and understands. And we all go through that, even the most famously, right? Even the most like, you know, Nobel prize winning writers have writer's block, right? <laughs> so even success does not guarantee that you won't feel these fears or have writer's block or that sort of thing. So I think for me, um, it's helpful to just acknowledge that, you know, and accept that writing can be scary. Um, but I think for me, writing is, um, is an adventure and adventures are going to be scary, right? Because you often don't know where you're going to end up. Uh, any good adventure, you don't know, it's no fun, right? If you know where you're gonna end up, right? It's not really an adventure. And what I love most about writing, academic or popular writing, is it helps me discover what it is I feel about the world and what it is I want to say about the world. And I often, I've, I often say that 
um, I actually don't know what I think about a topic until I've written it. And so for me, writing is that process, it's almost like a process of self-discovery, as much as it is of anything, of trying to just, as for myself, I almost begin with myself, of what it is I want to say, I learn, I learn about myself through the process of writing. Um, you know, I also think it's helpful, just some like more practical things, you know, is just um, a mantra that I have when I'm writing is that, um, is words don't write themselves. You know, so until you put that word on the page, it's not going to be written. It's just not going to happen, right? So for me, that's it just mo that's my personal like motivation to just write. And sometimes I find that um, I'll just start writing, and my first paragraph is terrible. My second paragraph is worse. My third paragraph is the worst yet, and then my fourth paragraph is like brilliant, <laughs> or I think it is, anyways. You know. And so it's like it's that process of just writing. Sometimes you just have to get words on the page and start forming your ideas, seeing what works, what doesn't work, and not be harsh on yourself. You got to kind of let go of some of that judgment and just write, just just get it going. Um, and a lot of people find it useful to do that in a regular way um, to, you know, every day set aside, you know, three times a week, whatever it might be, whatever your schedule allows, set aside a half hour set aside an hour, whatever it is, and just write. And um, if you're struggling with an academic paper, you know, a term paper, whatever it might be, um, maybe you write for that half hour about something you feel really comfortable, just write about what your day was, write about um, an experience you once had, tell yourself a story, right? Just sort of get in that mode. And then you, I think that kind of opens up doors um, in a way that, that feel blocked, you know, if you're just like, I need to write perfectly, I need to write on this topic, I have this deadline, whatever it might be. So hopefully those are a few thoughts that uh, help you open those doors uh, to new kinds of, of writing and different possibilities. All right. Um, we have a few minutes left here. Let's see if we can squeeze this one in. A follow-up question. If we are using published academic work as a basis to write for a platform like Sapiens, what's protocol for reproducing copyright materials? So, you know, the main thing is to be very clear up front with your editor, you know, saying um, whatever the case might be. So if this is, um, you know, I'm writing this, it's drawn from my academic work or it's inspired by my academic work or you know, I'm presenting anecdotes that are, you know, also in this academic paper, you just need to be really clear about that. Um, what we find is almost always, this is like a worry at, at the start. The reality is, is that even if you tell an anec ethnographic anecdote in a journal, the chances are the length, by the time you're done with the editing process for a popular audience, it's probably going to be very different. You know, it's just the, the, the amount of, you know, words are different. The tone's going to be a little different. The audience difference. You're going to have your editor giving you lots of feedback, right? So you need to be really upfront and be clear. Um, the reality is it's, it's pretty rare for there to be like a one-to-one -one correlation. Now, if it truly is like a excerpt or, you know, it's um, you are, re for whatever reason, you do end up using an entire chunk, then what we'll typically do at Sapiens is we'll just say, you know, at the bottom, there'll be a little editor's note. That will say, you know, parts of this are drawn from, you know, X article. Um, and then, of course, we would need permissions from where it was, wherever it was previously published. Um, so in short, one, be clear with your editor. Two, probably don't worry about it too much because by the time you're done with editing, it's probably going to change a lot. And then three, if, if there truly are, you know, whole sections that are reproduced, um, we just acknowledge that so the reader understands and we're all above board with copyright. Let's see here. So um, I think our time is up. Um, I'll look to Gideon or any of the other organizers if we need to end exactly on time or there's one last question I see. Yeah, I think we can accommodate this uh, one last question just so that okay. yeah. Complete. Great. Yeah. So we can end by answering everything if we can at this point. Uh, so a question here is if we attempt to write in Sapiens, would we endure months of waiting for a feedback or decision to come out? 
typically yeah of pure immune yeah has to match more to our anxieties <laughs> that is so true that waiting can be the hardest part right uh so in sapiens uh and most popular articles you are you of all your fears that is not one of them typically you'll hear back within uh a week sometimes maybe two weeks um that's usually the most and sometimes you'll hear back within 24 hours or 48 hours um and most art most major newspapers and whatnot they'll let you know too in their guidelines they'll say most often the wording is something like if we don't get back to you in three days then you can understand we're not interested so usually you're just kind of waiting on pins and needles for about three days and then nothing happens and then you move on to the next one um, so that's most typical at sapiens we always get back to people one way or another um, now the once it's accepted the pitch is accepted the amount of time from acceptance to publication that can vary anywhere from two weeks on the very very short end to usually more to two to three months um, so and but that's pre usually pretty active you're usually you know actively working with the editor at that point but that hopefully gives you a sense of the timeline and some expectations there. Um, last question is what's the acceptance rate and rejection rate for Sapiens? It's probably about 25% would be our acceptance rate. Um, and uh, although I would say people who've been through workshops like this, their acceptance rate is probably much higher because they really have a sense of what it is we're looking for and you know have some tools to use. Um, and so, you know, a lot of our rejections, frankly, are just people, they're not, they're, they're not good pitches. You know, they haven't really, and we try to lay out on our website what a good pitch looks like, and here's some tools, but the reality is, is they're not, you know, if they haven't taken the time to really study it, um, that's a, it's a hard beginning point. So, so for us, that's where we're at. Um, others are, can range quite a bit. I'd say the conversations, probably even less, they're probably like, I probably pitched them maybe eight times, and I think I've published four pieces with them. Um, and then others like New York Times, I've been rejected like 10 times, and they have published one of my pieces. So, you know, I mean, it, can, it really varies a lot by venue. You know? um, but hopefully that helps you get a sense of Sapiens and the work ahead if you're interested in this. Again, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with all of you, um, to have the chance to hopefully start building some bridges. Um, I look forward to uh, the opportunity to, to do more. Uh, please do reach out and uh, hope to see you all again soon. So thanks again. Thank you, Chip. I think it's a, been a very wonderful, it's, a, it's been a wonderful session. I think that of all, uh, all of us here, I speak for all of us by saying that this, this, we learned a lot from this and I am sure, I hope that you can look forward to, to pitches from coming from our anthropologist and it's very exciting to, to, to see this and I share your hope that this is the beginning of a collaboration between Ogat and, and Sapiens. So thank you, Chip. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Like I hope the rest of the conference is very successful. Absolutely. And I want to show to share with you this certificate oh of appreciation that we virtual certificate of appreciation to all <laughs> well for facilitating this workshop and really sharing so much more about writing to to all of us so again thank you very much that's beautiful and before, thank you before we end can we have a as we typically do we have a group virtual group photo so please join us i invite everyone to to turn on your cameras for this uh documenting this this workshop thank you everyone for also the questions that are really engaging and relevant not just for for popular writing but for academic writing as well so okay, okay. so we we have two panels for pictures all right so the first panel first everybody smile uh one two three okay moving on to the second panel Moving on to the second panel. Second panel smile. One, two, three. All right, all good. Okay, that ends our session. Again, thank you very much, Chip, and thank you for all the engagement, all the participation.
I wish everyone a good day and of course continued success for our ongoing conference. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Ma'am Suyen, you want let's start na po. All right, we can begin. With a minute. I think they've seen that background, have they not? No. Um, so, well, good af- good morning, everybody. Um, uh, I, I'm. Thank you for. Um, staying with us in this uh, UGAT conference. No? Um, I would like to just read out no? uh, some of our panel presenters. I see um, Dr. Sanen Marshall, Dr. Uh, is Dr. Veronica Atin um, around? No? Yeah, um, I'm here. Okay, so thank you very much. No? Uh, both of them, uh, come from, um, will be presenting a paper. I mean, they're from University Malaysia, Sabah in Kota Kinabalu in Sabah, Malaysia. And uh, we have Dr. Uh, Dr. Senen Marshall, who will be presenting the paper on the Tigoling ritual as a coping mechanism of the ethnic Dus- Dusun community of early colonial North Borneo for overcoming smallpox and other existential threats. Uh, after, uh, okay, so uh, shall we, shall, shall I do all the introductions all at once or uh, we'll do it one by one? One by one, first fine, and then I'll play the video. All right, okay, so uh, thank you for being here and uh, go ahead, I do. Hi, good, mo- uh, uh, good morning. Uh, maga dan umaga. Uh, salamat uh, to all conference participants in UGAD. Uh, my name is Senan Marshall, and uh, I'm going to present on the uh, ethnic Dusun device called Tingolik. Uh, which was used in uh, the late 19th century in North Borneo uh, to prevent smallpox yeah, as a traditional uh, device or ritual to present smallpox. Uh, together with my colleague, uh, Dr. Veronica uh, Petros Atin, uh, also from uh, uh, the Center for the Promotion of Knowledge and Language Learning, University of Malaysia, Sabah. Um, the structure of our presentation uh, basically deals with a number of uh, uh, aspects of the cultural practice of the Dusun, uh, which may be somewhat perplexing as we look backward more than 100 years. Yeah? Yeah? Uh, the device exists, the device, the physical device exists. I will show you photos later on. But uh, it is important to understand that this research was a combination of historical and uh, anthropological research, meaning to say we interviewed uh, what you would call a shaman or a ritual specialist of the Dusun community who was 90 something years old at the time when we interviewed her um, several years ago, uh, Madam Rompokon. uh, uh, the ritual specialist is called a, a bobolian in the in the Dusun language, and uh, on top of that, we had uh, archival records which uh, showed how the company uh, and the uh, Dusun engaged with this 
challenge of the pandemic of the smallpox in the late 19th century. So we have uh, oral traditions, which, which is a, a sacred prayer recorded from Madame Rompokon, which, uh, is, uh, with, which several years ago was still uh, uh, used in uh, 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 ritual practices by Madame Rompokon for uh, uh, the, her village. We have archival records from the British North Bodio Company, oh. and uh, we also have uh, visual uh, data, visual uh, uh, photographs of the device, the actual device of the Tingling, which uh, resembles, which we, which we can be quite sure based on the descriptions of uh, the British North Bodio Company and later travellers to Sabah, not too much later, uh, people who visited Sabah or who did uh, research in Sabah in uh, uh, 1906 and uh, 19, uh, the 1920s, uh, who also recorded very similar observations of the Tingolik. So, uh, what this slide basically uh, t says is that, number one, uh, smallpox was a global pandemic, yeah? uh, just like the one we're facing now. Uh, had a devastating effect on Native Americans, uh, also affected Sabah or North Borneo, and here, uh, as well as in many parts of the world today, uh, Western medicine, yeah, vaccination, was promoted as the uh, 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 cure for uh, smallpox, yeah, for protection against small, smallpox. And uh, like today, yeah, you also find uh, there was resistance against uh, vaccination, not just vaccination, but the ethnic Dusun communities of the villages I'm going to describe uh, were uh, generally uh, afraid you know, to a certain extent of Western medicine itself, yeah, not just vaccination. And so, um, just to sh uh, describe the place where we are uh, uh, doing our fieldwork, uh, this was in the Tiong cluster. Yeah? in the Tiong cluster, which is uh, at the bottom of the map. And there are a number of villages uh, uh, near the Tiong cluster, which, we'll be, we'll, which you, we will mention as well, you know, which are not named in the map, but we will mention as well uh, a bit later. So this is the actual device of the Tingolik. Uh, it is about yeah, uh, four feet, five feet tall, and uh, this one is found in the village of Tiong Pirumusan, that's the name. And this one was found in uh, the neighboring village of Tiong, uh, uh, of Terolobo. Yeah, Terolobo. And uh, these devices were uh, set up uh, not too far from each other, uh, around a dozen feet from each other. And now, there are some variations or differences in the devices, although they are more or less in the same location. Um, if you have a look at the uh, uh, device of uh, 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 Terlobo, you can see that the, the, uh, the, the covering is actually made of uh, zinc, whereas this is uh, uh, using a more traditional covering made of bamboo. But importantly, very importantly, that the device, the Tingolik of uh, uh, Terlobo has the figurine here, yeah, the clay figurine, which was actually recorded to have been used by the ethnic Dusun uh, by the British North Borneo Company more than 100 years ago. So this is very original, yeah? It's very important uh, uh, aspect of the uh, uh, device of the Tingolink. Uh, but interestingly, the device of the, uh, uh, the Tingolink of the uh, uh, Tiong Pirungusan has spears embedded in the ground near the Tingolink. And this, as, as we shall uh, see later, is also a very important aspect of the protection narrative of the Tingolik. So uh, I mentioned that uh, it was not just the British North Borneo Company records, but also visitors who visited uh, Sabah or North Borneo uh, later on. And this was uh, drawn by Harold Bear in the neighboring village yeah, of uh, uh, Bundu Tuhan. Also, you can see uh, the main aspects of the Tingle Lake, the roof, uh, the spears. Uh, one aspect that is uh, 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 different is that there are eggs in the tray. Yeah? Okay? Uh, but apart from that, uh, generally there are uh, uh, a broad, a broad similarities between the different devices of the Tingle Lake. Now, um, 
the main uh, uh, the villages uh, uh, also some of the some uh, uh, it was uh, recorded that uh, more than a hundred years ago some of the figurines also carry uh, rifles you know, not just uh, they can, some of them carry spears some of them carry rifles uh, but in general in the villages that we observe the spears are embedded on the ground yeah and uh, uh, but you can, you can also see yeah, this was uh, even a hundred years ago the ethnic Dusun were already innovating with their cultural devices yeah by uh, using uh, uh, drawing imitation uh, uh, constructing imitation rifles for the, the figurines that were uh, uh, the figurines that were uh, uh, found in the Tingling okay so uh, since we are researching something that happened more than a hundred years ago uh, even before, uh, probably even before the British North Borneo Company arrived in Sabah in the late 19th century, it is possible and uh, quite likely that the Tingolik had other functions before the uh, smallpox uh, pandemic struck. So, uh, you can see there the Tingolik as a role of a protector during head hunting wars that preceded the arrival of the company. So basically, what it appears, what appears to have happened is that the ethnic Dusun uh, uh, communities of the villages we are describing um, used uh, a known device to uh, expand the protection during the pandemic. Yeah, uh, uh, to uh, another function, which is a protection from disease. Yeah, uh, this is uh, written by Ivo Evans. This this entire paragraph, and um, it is uh, a, a very interesting uh, account. Yeah, but don't forget Ivo Evans is uh, writing in 1923, and he is quite close to the events he is describing uh, compared uh, compared to us. Okay, mm -hmm. and he, he writes uh, some a very interesting description of why. Uh, uh, the why the the, uh, uh, the ethnic Dusun of that time believed in the Tingolik as a protection against smallpox. I'm going to read this really fast. These signs are figures of men and spears set up to defend the villagers against the epidemic disease. These signs are set up in time of sickness. Sickness spirits see the signs and meet the spirits which have been called into the spears and figures by the religious performances. So on the one hand, you have the smallpox spirits. On the other hand, you have the uh, 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 spirits of the spears uh, uh, set up to protect the village. When the spirits of the smallpox are journeying in the country, they come to one of these signs and the spirits of the spear call to them, saying, the men of this village set us here to dispute with you. The men here are our men. You cannot pass. So it is settled that the spirits of the smallpox shall not enter the village. Yeah? But the spirits of the smallpox negotiate yeah, with the spirits of the spears of the Tingolik and ask them to point out another village to which they can go, saying, if you will show us another village, we will not enter this one. So it's like a bargain. Yeah? Uh, uh, in, in the term in the in the Dusun, uh, a cos, a cosmol, a cosmology, this is like a bargain between uh, 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 the attackers and the defenders. Yeah? Uh, this is the uh, uh, prayer uh, known as the Renite, uh, uh, obtained by my colleague uh, Veronica uh, from uh, Madame Rompokon, who is a ritual specialist and who was uh, more than ninety years old when we uh, uh, interviewed her uh, uh, several years ago. Yeah? Uh, I'm just going to read the, 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 the prayer in English. Take the rocks, get the pebbles, seven rocks arranged together, eight pebbles arranged together, and you get those for protection, get those for shielding protection of the village. She's uh, describing her ritual yeah, uh, that she uh, does while she is uh, at the site of the thing, uh, the, the, the thing only, uh, at Toro Lobo. Yeah? Uh, at Toro Lobo okay? So she's uh, describing uh, 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 what she does and uh, what she says when she's uh, uh, doing uh, the, 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 the ritual. Yeah? We, were, we were very fortunate to have someone who could uh, uh, recite to us the prayer said during the Tingolik ritual, which probably goes back more than a hundred years. Uh, elements of the social and moral universe of the Dusun through the Tingolik. Uh, the Tingolik offered uh, village level protection. The Tingolik uh, uses items familiar to the Dusun. Uh, 
uh, it was uh, in a sense uh, for maintaining the physical well-being of the Dusun, which had uh, practices that would be considered animistic. So in a sense, the Tingulik was familiar yeah, to the Dusun, to the ethnic Dusun, as uh, opposed to um, Western medicine, which was new yeah, to the Dusun. Uh, and in, a, in times of, don't forget this was in, in times of crisis, yeah, uh, uh, when the uh, Dusun were exper experiencing a, 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 a pandemic. As we, uh, 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 also important, uh, as, uh, is that uh, researchers who uh, describe cultural practices in general and uh, researchers who uh, actually uh, worked on uh, the cultural practices of the Dusun, uh, give us explanations yeah, why uh, such a device, as opposed to Western medicine, would have uh, comforted the Dusun, would have been seen as familiar, would have played a, not just a, a medical function, but a psychological function in uh, 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 helping ease their disillusionment with disillusionment with what was happening uh, to them uh, during this time of uh, uh, crisis yeah, of the pandemic. Yeah. And that uh, explanation is uh, also uh, uh, added to by the descriptions given by, again, Ivor uh, Evans, where he gives an explanation why some villagers eventually get infected yeah and again this is uh, i suppose part of the dusun cosmology in explaining why uh, in spite of the tingulik sometimes i don't forget bunutuhan uh, the village of uh, uh, tiong pirungmasan the village of uh, torolobo which are all uh, villages close to each other uh, all had tingoliks okay and so this is the other explanation why in spite of uh, uh, having tingoliks some villagers uh, uh, get uh, uh, infected and uh, uh, so basically it says yeah, that the uh, spirits of the spears or the uh, small uh, the, of the or the tingolic spirits uh, were not able to keep their bargain if all the villagers have tingolic tingolics don't forget the bargain was if you show us another village uh, we will be we will go to that village instead of coming to your village so that when the smallpox spirits come back to the village and say hey you you uh, said you will show us another village where we can uh, 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 go into and uh, and this time yeah, because all the villages have tingoliks <clears throat> uh, uh, the original village where the smallpox village uh, smallpox uh, 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 spirits went to uh, 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 now come back to and they say yeah you you weren't able to keep your bargain and so this is what the the tingolik spirits do yeah then one of one spirit of the smallpox finds a narrow part uh, 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 to the back of the village and follows it with others behind him. There's no spear at the back of the village, but only facing the road by which the smallpox comes and they enter this first village where they try to enter. Okay, and so that uh, I, I, uh, that means that the, uh, the uh, 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 smallpox village eventually come back to the same village and they infect that village if all the villagers in that district have tingolings. Yeah? Okay. So it's it's uh, it's uh, 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 interesting. Uh, it gives you an, uh, a, a view, yeah, into how the Dusun ethnic Dusun uh, probably in the 19, late 19th century uh, looked at the pandemic. In conclusion, from this research, the Dusun uh, resorted to Tingolik to protect uh, 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 their well-being, uh, rather than uh, chose to believe in uh, modern medicines uh, because of several factors, yeah. Uh, um, there was both a push and a pull factor. The push factor is that uh, the, the uh, problems of maintaining a cold chain in a heavy, heavily tropical uh, 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 forested area yeah, in uh, North Borneo or Sabah. So you can imagine even now we have uh, problems with cold chain in distributing vaccines. So uh, at that time, it would have been even more uh, uh, challenging yeah, to maintain a cold chain so that the vaccines, vaccines would actually be effective when they arrived in the interior of uh, Sabah or North Borneo. 
And so uh, the, th the company failed to give explanations, yeah, adequate uh, uh, explanations on why uh, the Dusun were still being infected by smallpox. And so uh, in that sense, uh, uh, the Tingling offered and it was an instrument of hope among the Dusun of uh, North Borneo in that era. Uh, uh, in, and that is the pull factor, yeah? Yeah, pull factor which uh, uh, allowed the practice of tingling to survive and to be uh, uh, commemorated even until a few years ago, yeah, and probably even now, yeah, if it, uh, if there are still ritual specialists uh, uh, maintaining the practice. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Marshall, for that presentation. From the past, um, we we find that. Uh, there are applications still today. No? We still go through pandemics. And so um, our next, I would like to um, go to our next speaker. We will reserve the questions for our speakers in the end. No? But, um, let me introduce to you our next speaker. Uh, he says he has internet problems. So um, perhaps uh, he can just answer questions and I can read it out later on. No? Say si Dr. Kahak, Tahak, um, Takashi no? uh, Tsuji is a faculty member of uh, Agriculture Graduate School of Sega University, Honjo, no? from Sega uh, City in Japan. And uh, his paper is entitled Lactose Intolerance and Coping Strategies in Bulacan Province. So he brings us to the present. I give you. Um, uh, Dr. Takashi's uh, presentation. Thank you. This presentation focuses on the relationship between Filipino people and lactose intolerance, with special reference to my fieldwork in Bracan. I aim to show you how Filipino people in a village of Blacan recognize and cope with lactose intolerance in this presentation. Filipino people tend to become diarrhea when they drink milk. On the, the contrary, European and pastoral people are not. The reason is the lack of lacto lactase caused lactose intolerance. This presentation explores how Filipino people have coped with the symptom, with their cultural ideas and behaviors from a viewpoint of anthropology of health. 90 to 100% of Southeast Asian populations, including Filipino people, are lactose intolerance. Lactose intolerance causes intestinal gas, intumescing, acute abdominal pain, diarrhea, and vomiting. Lactose intolerance is showing a high population among people in a specific area, increasing the number of affected people due to aging, causing symptoms of vomiting and abdominal pain, alleviated if it's uh, processed into dairy products and that is inherited across generations. Let's take a glance at some previous studies about lactose intolerance. The research studies, because of high incidence of lactose intolerance among milk-fed Africans in the United States in the mid 1960s. Lactose intolerance is common among Japanese people and that the frequency increases with aging. 
Ethiopians found that 71% of people vomited when they drank milk. 29% experienced abdominal pain. In Thailand, people who experienced symptoms of lactose intolerance restricted their intake of daily products. This is a lactose intolerance map in the world. Philippines shows the 91 to 100% population and one of highest areas of lactose intolerance. Research was conducted in San Miguel, Bracan, approximately 100 km north from Manila. Research area was Barangay S, composed of 2,141 households and 9,631 people in 2020. The targets were 50 adult Brakenos, 29 males and 21 females. Research periods were February 18 to 28, 2020, when COVID became a concern and one person refused to support my fieldwork. Research methods are uh, based on questionnaire and anthropometric survey. Research language was Tagalog. The research site is a rice farming village dominated by landowners and most people are peasants. The reason I choose this village was the fact people have milked water buffaloes from past and suitable to research about lactose intolerance. I collected anthropometric data of BMI and body fat to help investigating uh, lactose intolerance. However, it found no relations. I just share the data here briefly. People are mostly in obese 1 or obesity, although their economic condition is not good. Here I would like to explain the results of questionnaire research. In the village, 48% of people drink milk, which is slightly higher than 52% those who do not. 92% drink uh, 200 mm glass or less, and 4% drink 2 glasses of milk. A total of 62% of the respondents said they drink about once a month or no more. From these results, the amount of milk consumed by people was small and milk is not a frequent drink. I asked about the symptoms of milk intake. 28% of people have symptoms and responded that drinking too much causes symptoms in the, the, the abdomen. I believe they are lactose intolerance, but this result must be occurred from questionnaire bias. If researched properly, the percentage will increase more. Diarrhea, nausea, abdominal pain, 
are the symptoms and no such symptoms by the questionnaire. The duration of symptoms is one hour or more, one hour and one hour or less. The people answered that they would not interfere with their daily lives. The people answered they cope with the symptoms by combining foods. The basic combination is white rice and salted fish, but salt and sugar may be added to them. There is also combination with coffee. In the Philippines and in the China, people believe rice is good for intestinal problems, according to Kisumbin and Tavera. 17% of people drank milk warm and 50% did not. In the Philippines, Hokano described rice with a pinch of salt are used as folk medicine. The causes of various symptoms of abdominal pain are improper eating habits and food that causes the stomach to become cold and fever. This is a typical breakfast in the research site. People pour milk on rice with dried fish and this is one of their coping strategies for the symptoms. Lactose intolerance is included in sakit, but the people at the study site recognize it as diarrhea. Few people believed that milk was the cause of abdominal pain, and very few understood the causal relationship and mechanism of lactose intolerance and abdominal pain. People sterilize milk and consume it because it's usually consumed with cooked rice or poured into hot coffee. However, I want to express that lactose intolerance is due to sugar rather than bacteria. So I saw sterilization of milk is not inherently a medical prophylaxis. Milk can cause lactose intolerance and has inherently unhealthy aspects. However, as a result of this research, about half of the people who drink milk in the village. Since Spain brought milk culture to the Philippines, careful milk intake practices and processing techniques might be formed, and people may have acquired a culture that is less susceptible to lactose intolerance. The results of this study highlight that people don't rely on modern medicine to deal with lactose intolerance. The people adapted to lactose intolerance by daring to consume a small amount of milk and customarily compensated for the lack of the gene. Lactose intolerance is controlled by lactose gene, after all. In the Philippines, dairy farming began after the Spanish colonization in 16th century, with a history of only about 500 years. Filipino people had no contact with dairy until then and were not in the process of evolution for their body to adapt 
the milk. For Filipino people, milk is not available in a given environment, and alternative nutrition to milk has been obtained through farming and fishing. Therefore, it was not necessary to acquire the lactose gene among Filipino people. Now I conclude this presentation. To prevent lactose intolerance, reduce milk intake slightly. Take it with hot beverage and foods, which is wrong in modern medicine and device measures such as food combination and daily product processing. Filipino people have not adapted to lactose intolerance over a long evolutionary process and do not carry the lactose gene. However, as a result of this study, it became clear that people have used milk moderately without succumbing to lactose intolerance as a disease or stubbornly refusing. This research was funded by the Japan Milk Alliance, Sakura Foundation of the Society of Biosophia Studies, Institute for Animal Science, and the Ajinomoto Foundation for Dietary Culture, etc. Several milking farmers and milk processors helped with this research. The staff of the Philippine Carabao Center also supported this work. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Malamin Salamat. Thank you, Dr. Tsuji. Um, again, um, he looks at intolerance. And so um, we, see, we will ask questions uh, later on. No? Um, uh, I would like to give you Dr. San Pedro. No? He is our uh, resident medical anthropologist. Um, and he, Dr. Raymond Joshua San Pedro is uh, from the Council of Health and Development. No? And his paper is on um, decolonizing the secularized analysis and prospects for the COVID-19 response in the Philippines. Uh, I, I turn you over to Dr. San Pedro. <clears throat> All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, okay, uh, again, I'm Dr. Josh San Pedro. I'm a physician anthropologist working with the Council for Health and Development, as well as the Coalition for People's Right to Health. Uh, and uh, in this annual conference, I'll be presenting a uh, paper on decolonizing the securitized uh, historical analysis and prospects for the uh, pandemic response in the Philippines. Okay. So this, um, this paper um, comes from the experience of almost two years of uh, participatory action research uh, with community-based health programs and partner communities. Um, as well as uh, public engagement with duty bearers and um, and the uh, the communities and the general public and the mainstream media. Okay. So primarily, uh, we look into the COVID nineteen uh, and the pandemic response in the Philippines. Um, a lot of this uh, we've seen over the past two years as um, not being necessarily new in having a pandemic. Uh, we've seen several outbreaks of infectious disease in recent history. Um, we've seen, uh, we, as was discussed earlier, uh, regarding smallpox in the 18th century, uh, even cholera and uh, influenza. Uh, the Philippines had a major problem with, um, with these diseases, especially during the colonial era, uh, in, in a lot of them uh, continued from the Spanish uh, colonial period into the American colonial period and uh, caused a lot of problems, uh, but also uh, developed a sense of public health and an institution for it as um, created by the American colonial authorities. 
So afterwards, uh, in the Philippines, uh, in the uh, more recent history, uh, as an independent nation, uh, we continued to see several outbreaks. In fact, uh, dengue is uh, one of the major causes of outbreaks in our country and was uh, at one point even called Philippine hemorrhagic fever. Um, and that continues to plague our country to today as the dengue virus. Measles uh, came back uh, and continues to come back from time to time in areas, especially where vaccination uh, tar uh, vaccination has been low and um, there has been uh, a more recent uh, outbreak of that in uh, Metro Manila and in populate, populous areas. And even polio uh, um, that even came back uh, in the Philippines as one of the few countries to actually move backwards in its polio control program. And it continues for other uh, epidemics, including HIV and tuberculosis, that unfortunately becomes also infected with the advent of new uh, outbreaks of other infectious diseases. Uh, though the Philippines had uh, a very benign experience with SARS and MERS-CoV, COVID-19 really uh, showed a lot of uh, concern, especially with the, uh, the strain it did to our uh, to our health system. Now, the World Health Organization warned that COVID-19 can cause um, unknown havoc or damage to weak health systems, uh, in which the Philippines uh, is debatably you know, under uh, that concept of being a weak health system, uh, which is uh, based on either economy or health system capacity. And we've continued, continually uh, learned to live with the virus uh, through the longest lockdown in the world. You know, whether or not the lockdowns are effective or not is uh, continued, uh, continually debated, even among uh, scholars and um, policy experts. And realistically, you know, the Philippines continues to be among uh, those least resilient or among the last to recover in terms of international standards. But um, a lot of this no, we, uh, seems to be a major problem for the public health system in the Philippines. So what are the dominant narratives and discourses on the COVID-19 pandemic response in the country? Um, given all of that, no, why is there a struggle really, despite being in one of the longest lockdowns in the world and still having uh, those kinds of uh, international rankings? So a lot of the Philippine COVID-19 response based on our um, studies and experiences has shown to be individualized. No? There is a greater focus on uh, personal protective equipment. So it's uh, mostly the efforts are put on the individual uh, through face shields or face masks. You know, that they are, uh, people are reminded frequently about this. And even uh, those among uh, the, the COVID-19 response um, do emphasize you know, that it is a matter uh, not really of, of widespread government intervention, but really a matter of discipline of the population. And that leads us to what Brown and Baker uh, have called as responsabilization. So individuals are responsabilized you now because it is the responses are already individualized, but there is a caveat to that, that they are responsible for these, um, for, for avoiding the pandemic and uh, limiting the spread of the pandemic in the community. You know? So there is this emphasis on discipline, you know, that, that uh, the people have to be the solution to COVID-19, as, uh, as seen in the uh, official um, discourse by, by government agencies, you know, that discipline is really the emphasis. And thus, um, if you do not follow, uh, you become a deviant no, or a pasaway. No? And this leads to an exploitation of uh, the fear appeals. No? There has been a lot of uh, the use of uh, fear appeals. No? The, for example, the use of takot ako sa COVID or I'm afraid of COVID-19, which is one of the earlier um, national government uh, campaigns no? in, in April to May 2020. Uh, this was something that, that uh, was promoted you know, by, by several government agencies and into communities that people should be afraid you know, and thus be responsible uh, to take matters into their own hands, into their own families, uh, to be disciplined in fighting against the pandemic. 
And uh, more importantly, there is that securitization. Uh, the, the government's response and the, the COVID-19 response in the Philippines has been securitized. No? We see the use of uh, state security forces, both police and barangay officials, to implement protocols such as curfew and quarantine, no, as well as to apprehend violators. No? So some may be more humane than others. No, we see uh, certain uh, abuses. We see certain uh, numbers of people being warned, uh, being arrested, no, and sometimes uh, receiving unusual uh, and possibly cruel punishments. So, for example, no, we saw this that the. Uh, Physical distancing you know, was a matter of distance, you know, and that distance would be also used against those individuals if they were uh, not following that distance. You know, the use of the uh, yanto you know, or the uh, uh, bamboo stick, you know, which is usually measured for a meter, uh, measures a meter, and uh, uh, can also be used you know, as a weapon against those who are not uh, doing physical distancing and following health protocols. So there continues to be uh, a sense of familiarity with the uh, colonial legacy of public health in the Philippines while comparing it to COVID-19 policies. Uh, so um, a lot of the essence of securitization um, is multifactorial, but one major aspect uh, in terms of uh, possible scholarship is relating it to the colonial legacy of public health in the Philippines. Now, there continues to be a central uh, role you know, for uh, a major authority you know, in in both the American colonial structure and policies with the COVID-19 contemporary uh, situation. Now, there is a lot of military or security involvement in supposedly uh, health policy. Now, uh, of course, in the American colonial period, it was really a military government. So that explains a lot you know, of the uh, the use of, of military officials and, and how uh, public health was really entwined with the uh, military structure. Now, we see that in in many of the artwork as well as the uh, the documents. Now we have a lot of the historical documents. Now we have uh, we definitely have um, records and and major figures you now in in Philippine public health who were also military officials. Uh, however, in currently you now we see that that. Um, a lot of medicalization continues you know, that even daily life is being uh, controlled by an all-seeing body, which is the IATF or the NTF, you know, which can control um, the movement of individuals. It can control uh, what activities can take place, including uh, norm supposedly normal activities like caroling or going to the gym. You know, that uh, becomes uh, a major point where medicalization meets uh, the panopticon, according to Foucault. And uh, the, all this um, use of force you know, can also lead to violence and abuses that affects uh, the wider aspect of trust in the health system or a health response. So, for example, another major part of uh, policies you now seem to be holdovers from the American epidemic policies, uh, especially the Administrative Code of the Philippine Islands in 1917. Now, although this was made defunct in 1987 with the new Administrative Code, a lot of the uh, policies seem to be very familiar. Uh, for example, the use of uh, cremation. You know, the, the World Health Organization does not specifically say that anyone who tests positive for COVID-19 and dies must be cremated. No, there is actually no um, explicit recommendation. No, there is still room for burial as well as cultural and customary practices. However, the Philippines seems to have generally adopted you know, this notion that somebody who has died of COVID-19 must be cremated. No, and this is, seems to be very much a holdover from uh, the administrative code where it's actually um, blatantly mentions and explicitly mentions destroying by fire as a form of uh, of disinfection uh, and the mandatory vaccination is actually part of the 1917 administrative code um, specifically against smallpox no? so uh, this continues to be a debate until today you know, whether the Philippine government has that police power um, and a lot of that uh, is, is sourced you know, from laws in the uh, American colonial period. So, so we can see that both in uh, 
health practices. Where this is a picture of the burning of the Farola compound, where unfortunately uh, there was a smallpox epidemic in the 20s, but had spread actually beyond to the beyond the space where it was supposed to be limited. And we have actually jurisprudence on uh, individuals who refused vaccination, uh, especially when smallpox was mandated uh, since 1917, and there was actually a conviction and an overturning of a case in 1936. So health workers, unfortunately, also contribute to the status quo. Um, the majority of the population has been conditioned, really, to uh, accept you know, that, that individuals are at fault. You know, and that continues to be a legacy of, uh, of public health in the colonial era, that it is mostly a matter of responsibility and has to be enforced you know, by, by uh, uh, securitizing uh, agencies. You know, and there's that continuous uh, use of fear appeals you know, in uh, uh, prescriptive prescriptive medical uh, languages and and the attitudes you know, that people must follow what is the advice of healthcare workers under pain of death or pain of further injury and this continues you know, in in mainstream medical discourse so the need to decolonize public health you know, must also reflect on perhaps improving the covid-19 response you know? so uh, there continues to be a need you know, to be cognizant of and reflexive in the uh, holdovers of colonial approaches to disease. You know, there must be a conscious effort to uncouple public health and security uh, so as to avoid the abuses you know, that, that worsens actually the situation. You know, there have been uh, many individuals who have suffered greatly, not just because of the disease, but because of the policies. You know, there have been at least eight recorded deaths, for example, uh, among uh, those who were accosted as quarantine violators. Uh, there is a need really to restructure the power dynamics in the prescriptive nature of healthcare, especially in a colonial setting, you know, the col coloniality that the, uh, the health workers are above you know, and prescribing what is needed in people's lifestyle instead of uh, maximizing their participation. There is a need to normalize health equity and capacity, you know, to dismantle uh, monopolies as well as dependence, uh, so as to uh, decentralize you know, the not just the the responsibility and the authority, but also the resources. And there is a need to improve really the matter of healthcare that continues to be uh, underfunded and uh, a glaring uh, lack of healthcare workers in society, thus leading to more securitization in the process. And there's a need to acknowledge, uh, perhaps uh, aside from decolonizing, that, that reality that there must be a framework of human rights, albeit also decolonizing that aspect of human rights to enable uh, community participation and find additional counter narratives you know, beyond the Pasaway um, that is dominant. You know, there's a need really uh, in decolonizing to enable um, new narratives, to enable, uh, and you can only have that you know, through. Uh, wider participation by the general public. So uh, before I end, I'd like to mention, of course, the need you know, for engagement of anthropologists and communities you know, with health policy, uh, especially with a major concern on decolonization and securitization. Uh, there is a need to identify the embedded structural violence still in our health policies. You know, there continues to be these colonial artifacts and the lack of evidence in certain policies. Uh, Farm, Paul Farmer called this as immodest claims of causality or scapegoating the wrong things, including culture. Uh, and there needs to be an ensuring of the active participation instead of furthering uh, what is also defined by uh, by. Uh, Bourdieu as social distance. Now, the, in, the, in a time of social distancing, there is a furthering of social distance or the enmity among classes and among uh, individuals in society. There is a need to assert solidarity outside of that colonial or neocolonial models. Now, we need to, as our speakers mentioned uh, previously, to explore the other local, regional, or native responses while also acknowledging that this is a disease that is novel and is new. No? So there is uh, limitations on what traditional knowledge can do with regards to a very new disease and a rapidly evolving one at that. 
So there also has to be uh, a concern regarding the cultural dimensions of these interventions and the responses uh, to change and the need really to build a trust, especially among culture bearers, uh, towards a more self-determined and empowered health system that is along the lines of decolonization. And lastly, to force a conversation, not just with health professionals, but also health education that really needs to be an essential step in the further decolonization and desecuritization of a uh, health response, not just for the pandemic, but also in the future. So to end, I'd just like to cite uh, that in every major res retrospective study of infectious disease outbreaks, the historical regard has shown us that what was not examined during an epidemic is often as important as what was and that social inequalities are still important in the contours of past disease emergence. So this is uh, from 1996, uh, written by Paul Farmer. And with that, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to uh, answering the questions and further engagement. Thank you very much. OK, thank you so much for that very that interesting situation from all our presenters of looking at traditional uh, ways of dealing with a pandemic or ways of dealing with a current and recurring issue, no? uh, lactose intolerance, plus now we interrogate, um, you know, uh, uh, our practices of the present and how we deal with the current pandemic. So I'd like to open the floor. You know? uh, anybody can post their questions or maybe there are existing questions from the public or the, um, the participants. No? Um, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, type your questions on the chat box. No? Um, but uh, while we're waiting for the questions, um, well, th this is a question on decolon decolonization. You have given a lot of uh, suggestions. Um, I, I was thinking as you were presenting that uh, we seem to be aware of uh, the idea of interrogating and negotiating repressive uh, measures. No? Um, however, uh, my question for you, Dr. San Juan, San Pedro, is has to do with have this been communicated to the decision makers? You, you mentioned that we have to be engaged the, and it uh, probably includes engaging uh, the decision makers, the implementers, if you will. So that's one question so far. Right. Thank you very much for that question, Ma. So definitely, it has been a major part to really engage uh, what I mentioned as uh, duty bearers, uh, those who really have a duty to implement uh, not just a pandemic response, but also a constitutional one and um, uh, with regards to the right to, to health. No? And, and that has been uh, one of the campaigns that we have been doing as part of public engagement together with communities. No? But um, I guess one thing, if, if the policies themselves uh, continue to be repressive and it is dominant, you know, there must be a lot of uh, pressure to really bring out the counter narratives. You know? that, that is something that has been difficult, especially when we have um, uh, a leadership that can, uh, uh, does not really involve a lot of the grassroots uh, uh, in, in the decision making. No? So that's the challenge that continues to be a challenge that we try to uh, use democratic spaces. Uh, but unfortunately, even during the pandemic, these spaces are also very limited. No? And that, that really, I think, contributes to a lot of uh, concerns no? using legal avenues as well as uh, social media no? to do so. Um, but again, uh, if there is that element of, of being repressive. Uh, it can go beyond you know, the, the health protocols as well. Right? That's, that continues to be a challenge for many. I don't see Dr. Marshall um, uh, open right now, but I see Dr. Atin. No? And uh, it's in a way related to Dr. San Pedro's um, idea on vaccination, uh, what struck me at least in your paper was that there seemed to be a distrust as well no? uh, from uh, your um, 
historical, yes, uh, now I see Dr. Marshall, uh, your historical uh, documentation and how distrust was um, uh, a result of um, not knowing and unfamiliarity. No? Uh, maybe the question for you, for me now is that uh, what brought you or what uh, drew you into being interested in this topic? Is it something that is uh, still seen? No? You, you mentioned that you still saw the structures, but do you still see some of these local practices in your area, in the areas you visited? Oh, you're, uh, you have to unmute yourself, Dr. Sanin. Dr. Marshall, yes. We're not... Maybe not. without... Not the earphone. Okay, yes. I, I'm going to defer to my colleague uh, Veronica because uh, Veronica actually lives in the area close to the. Uh, Veronica, would you mind? Hi. Yeah. Good morning. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, sorry, I didn't really get the question, Doctor. Is it um that are still people having the same mentality? Is is that a, a correct uh, paraphrase of the question? Yes, because you spoke of the physical structure still present and still seen. But yeah. um, yes, the question is, uh, it, it, that must have been quite interesting for you. And um, I, I see parallels in terms of uh, the structure looking like an isolation, is isolating uh, uh, area, no? and that uh, you also have uh, resistance to um, uh, modern medicine. Uh, the question is, are those things still apparent? I, I mean, are they still seen, seen today you know, in terms of uh, cultural uh, practices? Yeah. Ah, I see, I see. Yeah, so I think um, it is more for the sake of culture that we still have those structures actually because the people converted to Christianity and Islam long time ago, but our kind of Christianity and Islam, I think, perhaps it's a little bit, you know, infused with culture because, yeah, even though we practice, for example, the prayers, of, um, it's predominantly Catholic. So normally they will use Catholic prayers for the um, protection of village, but they still respect all those old structures. So I suppose it is where um, uh, we still respect the culture, but at the same time we practice our modern beliefs on religion. Okay, so uh, the practice shifted from uh, spirits of uh, uh, negotiation, uh, the metaphor of negotiation with the spirits. And then you see that today we also negotiate no? uh, um, rules, no? uh, things that, uh, I mean, the discourses and the approaches to um, uh, how a pandemic would be uh, moderated, right? Uh, yes. yes. No longer to the, to the uh, spirit of the tree is not not um, the old way of doing it anymore. But we still have the structures of tingling and all that, so that we don't forget. I mean that it used to be like that. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, with regard to the current pandemic, um, no one is. Uh, actually reluctant to have the vaccination. So that is something good. Okay, so there's now more acceptance today compared to uh, the early 1900s and the, the, um, the 19th yeah. century. No? Yes. Uh, but in the case of the Philippines, uh, there is uh, that uh, resistance. No? We, uh, we still deal with vaccine hesitancy um, and there's still distrust uh, with medicine no, in some areas, because in uh, the in, in some of the cities where information is available, then people are just uh, wanting to um, have their uh, shots. No, they're just waiting for their turn. Uh, Must be scary for them. <laughs> so, um, Dr. Tsuji. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm not seeing questions in the chat. That's why I'm throwing all these questions right now. Um, would you would you say that a lactose intolerance 
and the way uh, we have dealt with it, um, uh, would be effective for at least for the group that you have studied. We haven't you haven't done any comparison with uh, a group uh, that really consumes milk, no? And so um, maybe we uh, in your study you saw that there was no um, uh, development or no need to acquire the gene that can you know break down the lactose but uh it would be interesting i don't know if uh, you would find it interesting if there are comparisons with other groups in your um, search for those who have developed it in, in asia at least or in our area uh, i already uh, compared my research in indonesia beside the philippines Yes. And Indonesian people also have lactose intolerance, more than 75%. But in Bulacan, I just find out 28% because of my uh, failure of my research. Uh, anyway, Filipino people know how to deal with lactose intolerance without modern medicine by their indigenous knowledge. Okay, yes. yes. And uh, you, you're finding that it works, no? Whether they make the causal association uh, that uh, yes. can produce uh, intolerance. Uh, in your findings, yes. by way of practice, are you, you're seeing that it works? Uh, yes. For, against the lactose intolerance, they have a traditional culture to make cheese uh, called queson putti or pastillas. It's a daily milk product and it, they are a protection against lactose intolerance. So they have knowledge to prevent from lactose intolerance, but locally, not totally in the Philippines. Okay, um, so Dr. Josh, there's an interesting question here in the chat. Following the historical trend or pattern of pandemic response and policies, do you think that the so-called um, new normal or uh, new normal, I think now it's even, uh, uh, there, there's another term, right? It's, uh, uh, it's not so new no, at all. No, we call it new normal, but it's not so new. Should, uh, and thus should be problematized if we are to decolonize our current health approaches and practices. I think uh, definitely with regards to calling it a new normal or even um, theoretizing or problematizing the new normal, I think we really have to look again at their historical trends and our patterns, our biases, um, because the old normal was never really uh, able to meet any of those uh, uh, proper health responses you know, in terms of providing proper health access to many individuals uh, by removing that aspect of distrust you know, with uh, health authorities. I think that also stems from really a lack of health equity, a lack of access to healthcare. Uh, to relate to our uh, speakers, I think one reason why people have learned to adapt on their own way is because of the lack really of those health services. I mean, um, giving lactase supplements to lactose intolerance individuals uh, could be an option, but perhaps with the lack really of, uh, of proper health services, of proper health workers in the old normal, uh, this was not um, able to happen. You know? So definitely when we talk about a new normal, it should really be questioning whether the old normal was enough or the new normal should be better in, in the sense that it should address larger structural concerns, larger social determinants. And that is um, a big part you know, in decolonizing those, uh, that, that approach and relationship you know, between those who are handling health and those who, uh, who have a right to it. You know? So definitely that has to be uh, put into the conversation. 
Thank you for that um, response. Are there any more questions? Um, maybe even the panel members can have a con can carry a conversation among ourselves, not if uh, I'm one among themselves. I, um, if if you will, if there are, I'm not seeing a lot of questions in the chat, no? um, unless I'm missing it. Mm. I mean, uh, from Saba, it's always uh, curious what's happening in the Philippines. <laughs> so I, I, I uh, uh, the la last presenter, you know, interesting uh, 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 paper in terms of depth. You know, um, I don't know, maybe. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, maybe I, I would ask you what you think of. Um, you know, uh, ways we could collaborate on such research, no? Since we, we seem, uh, a few of us are seem to be doing very much uh, similar research, no? Between Saba, you know? And, and I, I mean, there's, there's a lot, I, this is my second conference, by the way, in Ugat. You know? So there's lots lots of things I think we, sh we could, uh, you know, collaborate you know, with each other. And, why, and why, is it, why isn't it happening yet? So that's my question. Why isn't the Saba Philippines uh, Anthropological Linguistic Corporation happening? Dr. San Pedro. <laughs> I, I <laughs> agree. Uh, for you. <laughs> uh, totally interesting, yes. Uh, to extend uh, um, and, and compare again, I, I guess, no? Uh, uh, that's what you want to look into, Dr. Marshall. Um, and maybe uh, I'll add to that question before Dr. San Pedro asks um, Do you have the same experience, no? Uh, in terms of uh, what's happening in uh, where you are? Would you have um, the same kind of resistance? Or uh, I think your colleague was saying that now people embrace the vaccinations and uh, uh, how are you? Maybe that's my question. How are you right now? Um, are you free to roam around? Are you still implementing? I mean. Are, are the protocols as stringent as it is? Um, uh, we are in phase four, which means uh, we are practic practically out of it. Out of it, okay. And uh, resist all over Malaysia, there's not been much, much resistance. We are very high on the world uh, charts, like 90% of Malaysians are... Uh, adults uh, have been vaccinated. 73% of all Malaysians have been vaccinated. So we have quite high. Uh, I, I, but for, for very sp uh, very uh, specific contemporary and historical reasons. Okay. So now, sorry, Dr. Sampedo, it's your turn. You could, you could respond to Dr. Marshall. Yes, uh, I agree. I think there really has been limited scholarship in terms of uh, comparing and contrasting our, our uh, experiences, especially with regards to, to health. And I think that also stems a lot from the colonial history as well. And being the, in the Philippines, really being distinct with the rest of its neighbors uh, as being colonized by Spain and America and um, eventually being, you know, in some degree, uh, not really isolationist, but really um, thinking itself apart from the rest of Southeast Asia compared to Southeast Asia have, although despite having Southeast Asia having a lot of very similar experiences, even with securitization. Um, I was in a discussion before where I heard uh, Malaysian and Indonesian experiences with securitization that are very, very similar with, with the Philippines. No, but it's uh, ironic, I guess, that, that the Philippines is not aware of that, uh, does not realize that there must be, especially in a worldwide uh, pandemic, that there must be a need for bigger solidarity. Uh, I think that really has affected a lot of Philippine academics and as well as practitioners in terms of um, looking at our neighbors in the responses. The Philippines has really been left behind in terms of aspects of solidarity, um, even with technology in, in terms of vaccination. But I think Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam have all started to produce their own vaccines and the Philippines is not. Uh, the Philippines still has relatively low vaccination rates at around 32% of its population being fully vaccinated. And a lot of that really is from the lack of, of community-based information and the lack of uh, uh, the lack of 
perhaps reassuring uh, aspects that that really have to shift away you know from from using fear from using um, securitization um, but towards uh, perhaps what our colleagues in in uh, in uh, Southeast Asia have discovered in terms of decolonizing uh, health practices. So yes, I look forward to further engagement and collaboration. Thank, thank you, Dr. Sang. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so do I. It would be very good, and, and I'm sure everyone in the um, in the room would agree uh, uh, in, in terms of um, the directions that we move, you know, and uh, how hopefully we could look forward to. Uh, scholarship, uh, training eyes into uh, the inquiry of our practices. Um, are, 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 well, it is 11.21, no? um, perhaps we would like to give each uh, presenter the time now to give their last words or unless you would still want to, con oh, I see. A, a, a hand raise, Dr. Abaya, uh, go ahead. Hello, everyone. I'd like to ask Josh if he has some thoughts about um, how um, can, you know, our experience, your experiences and as a medical doctor can inform the teaching of uh, medical sociology or medical anthropology in the Philippines. I, I think we need the kind of material and and uh, also the idea of uh, sort of expanding our understanding of the ways in which local communities exercise their agency. You know, I, I want to know more about that. Um, in yung mga concrete uh, moves coming from the ranks of you know ordinary people. And have you paid attention to this? Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, with the first part, I think with medical education, there really has to be, or even health education, no? with all our health uh, practitioners, with our health workers, there really has to be a need to have more of medical humanities, you no know, medical social sciences, uh, in the discussion. You no, know, there is very limited understanding of medical history. There is very limited understanding of how this has uh, influenced uh, current uh, discourse, current mindsets, current biases. You now that really have to be questioned. You know, the fact that um, health workers uh, who should be valuing uh, life are, are, you know, are, are willing to accept uh, certain degrees of fear appeals or even uh, the, the punitive approaches to health no? na parang uh, yung what we hear na buti nga sa kanya or you know, uh, the, the uh, acknowledging the the misfortunes of others because they are pasaway you know because they are deviants no? that that continues to be a major aspect that has to be uh, uh, discussed no? and that has to be part of the curriculum I think that definitely has to be uh, part of the conversation with, with medical practitioners no? and also health advocates from communities no? that that has to be an aspect of empowerment as well and I think that also boils down to the fact that uh, we have limited amounts of, of health workers no? a lot are choosing to go abroad and, and in communities are even less no? those outside the cities are even less so uh, you already have limited access to to health workers and, and health information and health services to begin with. You know, and then you have these services that are, uh, and these, these individuals who are also lacking in terms of medical humanities. So it, it, it worsens the, the problem. You know? and, and, and in terms of the agency of the individuals, so when we try to engage them, you know, the Philippines has in some degree institutionalized a sense of community agency through the barangay health workers, to the barangay health emergency response teams, but this may not even be enough because these are also politicized as well. Now, there are also that aspect that that even the agency of, of uh, communities and health workers have to go along the lines of politics, especially that health in the Philippines is devolved. You know, that has a lot of, of uh, 
of politics even at the level of health services no? so yes there is some room for a lot of uh, agency among uh, community members in terms of health no? but uh, with with without a structure for that no? meaning a very uh, weak health system a very weak health system especially in marginalized communities uh, there will be that tendency for it to develop outside uh, the mainstream you know, and that can be beneficial but that can also be deleterious especially when we deal with very new diseases like COVID-19 so I think there really must be uh, an improvement of the structures an improvement of the uh, dialogue and conversation among uh, the communities the anthropologists the, those in the medical sociology and medical humanities with education and the wider public Thank you, Joyce. Thank you for that. Oh, thank you for your question and the response. So, well, we have, um, I, I don't know, um, and are there any more questions? Would anyone else want to um, uh, join in the conversation? There being none, can we hear last words from our presenters then? Um, maybe I'll, I'll call all of them back and uh, they might want to say uh, one last thing yeah, um, before we uh, award uh, your participation. No? Uh, Maybe you would like to say one one-liners, no? How, um, what you would like to, uh, how you would li like to see um, the direction, and we'll just have one-liners regarding your presentation. Yeah, for, for the uh, sorry, can I, can I go? Can I go first? Yes, yes, thank you. For the for, for the for the future, uh, uh, even with, as we speak, immigration is a huge issue between Sabah and the Philippines. Uh, let's uh, talk about it. Thank you. Okay, so there's one area of collaboration. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Atien. Uh, yeah, so uh, I am so happy to be here today. And yeah, as Dr. Sanan, I would like to see more international collaboration on research in this uh, kind of themes. Thank you. So Dr. San Pedro, I think you have a lot in your hands. <laughs> uh, people would want to collaborate with uh, you. No? Uh, is Dr. Tsuji still here? Yes. Yes, I'm back. Okay. Uh, we were asked, we, we gave the floor for the speakers to give their last words. Uh, I think you were disconnected. So um, we're finding that in the future, there can be more collaboration. Uh, in your case, uh, what would you like, what message would you like to leave uh, the panel, or the panelists, I mean, the yes. panelists as well as the audience, yeah? The anyway, panel. we have to be healthy, especially for the Filipino. Filipino need health, uh, but uh, some people cannot access to the enough health, so we have to give the health equally. So it's our work as anthropologists to create the happiness of the all Filipino people. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Suji. Uh, I think you 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 struck a, um, a common point for for all of us that. Uh, inequity and that huge gap no, um, is something that we have to address in whatever space that we occupy. And so, um, uh, Ido, uh, I would like to um, present uh, the, um, uh, the certificate. No? Uh, uh, this is our certificate, Ugnayan uh, Pangagham Tao. No? together with the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, no? Anthropological and Sociological Initiatives of, of the Ateneo, and IPC, the uh, Institute of Philippine Culture, 
present uh, the certificates of appreciation to Dr. Senen Marshall no, for, for, um, for presenting a paper on Tingolig, as well as what are the other certificates that we have. Uh, to the same with Dr. Veronica Atien, no? uh, Takashi Tsuji, and Dr. Raymond Joshua San Pedro. Thank you very much for being with us and um, have a good day. Uh, oh, uh, before we depart, no? can we oh, allow Dr. Or is this, is this still uh, applicable? No? Um, there's another question, apparently. So I awarded the certificate, but I, I see there's another question. There, um, for uh, Dr. Uh, San Pedro, I think a lot of questions are being directed to you, Dr. Josh. What approaches or strategies on how the locals, those who are living far-flung areas, no? especially in our country, uh, the Philippines, able to accept and balance their existing culture in terms of medicine, as well as the scientific approach, you know, just like our COVID vaccines. Thanks. There, that, uh, that was a question. <laughs> Last question, and there was a request that if you could please answer that. <laughs> yes, Paul. Uh, so I think a lot of our speakers were, you know, have answered this in a way that there really needs to be um, uh, dialogue, you know, especially with the uh, present traditions, the cultural uh, behaviors, as well as the the reception, the, the cultural appropriateness, and the reception of these in communities. You no, know? but uh, for this to happen, there has to be those services in those communities to begin with. You no, know, we cannot have a dialogue on vaccination uh, and vaccine hesitancy, for that matter, in areas where the vaccines are not even available. You no, know? where there is no health worker in the community. You know? So there really has to be that presence to to be able to establish that dialogue and thus to even and also to decolonize really the percep the the perceptions and the 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 perspective of these uh, medical professionals in these areas no? so there really has to be uh, that room for dialogue no? because <clears throat> if this uh, the existing culture um, has that no has their has those beliefs no like the thing league as mentioned earlier in 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 the Dusan communities now if there will be no uh, vaccination arriving there will be no dialogue there will be no acceptance because there is no none to begin with and you cannot call that vaccine hesitancy because there's no availability so um in that respect now there has to be first that presence and that uh, dedication for there to be a presence of of health in these communities and then we, we can have that dialogue on the balance and the acceptance now because uh there is that that important need to establish primarily and then when that happens you know, there has to be a conversation in terms of again removing that the that removing the colon colonized aspect of we are better than you and we are giving you sanitation we are giving you health and this um disagreeing with whatever cultural practices you know, and that's part of the colonization uh, not really just by rejecting uh, Western medicine, but really having that dialogue and removing that power relation that Western medicine has trained people to to have, you know, and that that really has to be uh, that aspect of of discussion, you know, that aspect of solidarity uh, that many of our neighbors have have uh, experienced actually, but in the Philippines seems to be um, uh, undervalued and then perhaps a long way to go in terms of uh, scholarship and engagement. Thank you for that reminder. So this is quite anticlimactic, but before <laughs> we have, uh, and I'm looking forward to this because um, I, I also work with uh, doctors at med school. So um, uh, I, I'm, I'm dying to share uh, the recording, you know, if possible, uh, to others, no? to, communicate, uh, to communicate with others and uh, have that in mind. No? Um, okay, I think uh, this uh, we are good, no? But before uh, taking a break and having lunch, uh, may we ask everyone to please open your um, your 
video so that uh, Ido can take your our picture no, for this panel. Okay, uh, Ido, it's okay. your. This is yours. All right. Um. Yeah. Okay. So smile, everyone. On C. One, two, three. Okay. All good. For okay. Thank you. With that, I say goodbye. And uh, thank you, thank we'll you so much. Thank you very much. Bye thank bye, you. everybody. Have a good bye, day. Bye, everyone. Lunch. <laughs>Skills? Well, yeah, one o'clock. Ah, one o'clock. Ah, final okay. siya na, final na parallel sessions and then there's a book launch at two o'clock. Ah, wait, 2.30. Hmm. Ay, nako. Patong-patong yung mga seminars natin. At saka, <laughs> so, I, I still have something after. I'll try to catch something. No? But, um, Thanks, Suyan. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. Uh, one o'clock. Bye. Bye. Thank you. I know. Since I'm here, I know I'm the I'm yeah, the sure. moderator for the next session of what said one. Yeah. Right. So I retype my name now. Okay. With okay. Yeah. Thank you. See you later. Hi Daniel. Um. Good so, yeah, yeah. I saw your email about the rescheduling. Uh, re right, right. And then uh, I just I just remembered. Um. So after your panel, it's gonna be a book launch uh, for Gideon's book at. 2.30. So if we can try to end by 2.25 at the latest uh, so we can have more time to uh, let people in right. for the 2.31. I can remind them to join. Oh, no, no. It's the same panel. So people will be on, right? Stay on. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No problem. You're the boss. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Edo, the room will remain open, but uh, will you be, you know, this... Uh, disabling the waiting room or enabling the waiting room. Enable ko na lang po. Uh -uh. And then for the participants, I'll place you the waiting room na lang po, the participants. Yeah, thank you. Should we said, leave the live stream? Ah uh, yes, we can we should stop the live stream. How do I do that?